Hey, welcome back to another episode of Red Dot Forum Camera Talk. Uh, I am one of your co-hosts, David Farkas. I am joined, as always, by Josh Lair. Hey, everybody. Uh, we've switched again, in case you <laughs> haven't noticed, so just to kind of keep you guys on your toes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, producing the show, as always, we've got Jose Rivera. Hello, hello. And Kirsten Vignes is in the chat, keeping an eye on your questions, comments, and concerns, and hitting you up with some links. So today uh, is our 30... Yeah, we're, we're calling it our 30th episode, kind of not exactly, maybe like 31. Well, because we had some special special ones that we had to sneak in there, like the, yeah, the 35 yeah, yeah. Apple, We've had right? some, some intermittent ones, but this is our tradition of every 10 episodes right. of, of doing Ask Us Anything, Yep, which is kind of a free-for-all <laughs> of just the questions that are burning in your minds. Um, we tend to get a lot more questions than we can answer, so I'm sorry in advance for the fact that we won't answer everyone's question. But well, I should also give a shout out. Thanks so much. We've been getting questions uh, from mm. email, Instagram, in the the live chat, which seems to evaporate for some reason, which we can't figure out. But um, we've got a, a whole slew of questions that we we've copied down. Jose has got a list that he's going to feed us, and we see more coming in. So so keep them coming because we're going to try to kind of hit these rapid fire yeah. and um, see if we can get you guys the answers that you so... Yeah. I think um, two takeaways mm -hmm. that if you're watching this or if you haven't watched one of our Ask Us Anythings, just to be aware of, number one is you can ask us anything you want. Um, David and I are not privy to what's next for Leica. So we couldn't answer questions like, when's the next M coming out? When's the next CL coming out? Mm -hmm. You know, we get excited about new gear as much as everyone, if not more so, but we don't know. So we can dream, but... We can't answer those questions because we genuinely don't know. Um, that's the first thing. The second thing is that a lot of questions we're going to say, as we always do, it depends. Um, because it does. It does it often does. depend. A lot of questions, we need more context. And mm -hmm. sometimes we'll ask if you're in the chat. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we'll just make assumptions. So yeah, that's the other thing. Because sometimes it's like, if you just say, what's the best lens? Like, well, <laughs> I don't know how to answer that. So yeah. we're going to do our best. Um, how are we doing on subscribers these days? We hit what did we hit fifteen thousand was our last milestone, right? We did. Yeah. We're more than that now, but more is better. So yeah. if you haven't yet, please subscribe to Reddit Forum's YouTube channel and be sure to hit the notification bell and get all alerts so you know when we post new content and go live and mm -hmm. things like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, as always, you can head to red.forum.com uh, for the latest like news, reviews, tech articles, much more. Uh, a lot of times in our episodes, we'll link to those resources down below. Um, this particular one obviously is, like Josh said, a free for all. So yeah. we haven't, we don't know what yeah. those things are going to be yet. Yeah, this is these episodes are always fun because we really, yes, we do get some questions in advance, and we try to bring the relevant item. Mm -hmm. But the reality is, we'll just we just take it as they come. So I sure. think we should probably just get started. Well, um, one other one other thing. Um, yes. Very often, uh, in, in because we've done more than thirty of these episodes, and there's just pretty large amount of information mm. that we've covered already. Uh, sometimes we'll reference back to another video that we've done. And obviously, if you haven't seen that, it might be problematic. So what we're gonna do is try to give, uh, if we run into the one of those scenarios where we've covered something in depth, we will give a kind of a brief answer to address it and then tell you where you can find it. Yeah. So if you've missed any of our previous episodes and you wanna catch up on them, or if you have specific interests, I've created playlists for all of our Red Dot Forum Camera Talk Live episodes, there's a playlist that is actually linked in this description or that you can find on our channel. I've also created sub playlists as well for M-related content, SL, Q, monochrome, things like that. So if those are of interest to you, dive in, check them out. Uh, it's great to have you guys here live, but you don't have to be live. You can watch this anytime. Uh, anytime in the future you want to reference something we said, uh, something that we shouldn't have said, you can find it. And uh, I go. think with that, let, wow. We've yeah, got that's great. I'm gonna, what I'll do, people. Jose, is I'll give you um, a number. We have a spreadsheet open. We're populating the questions. So I can see them from here, which is why I'm looking over it here. Um, so Jose, I'll give you a line number, like a spreadsheet line number. <laughs> and that'll be the, because we we're gonna try to keep some order. Okay. Um, well, we're just gonna get right into it. So what question sure. did I yeah. like? Um, something, it was, it was here. Oh, where'd it go? What do you see? No, it's in here. Oh, let's answer number 18. All right. 
It's a fun one. It's a question with. that came in uh, through Instagram. Mm-hmm. Which 50 millimeter lens would best complement the 35 millimeter Summicron version 4? Yeah, that's from Will Funk. Mm-hmm. And I like this question, and I was thinking about it uh, because it was submitted ahead of time. So, of course, I'm going to say it depends because do you want a lens that has a similar experience to the, the version 4, except a 50? Then I would probably go with a 51 4 uh, pre spheric, like a late version, late 46, or maybe like a version 2 50 Summicron uh, rigid. That's going to feel similar if you want something complementary to that. If you want something that's totally different, so you can have two totally different looks, I would go with a 50 Summicron version 5 or even a 50 Summerant. The Summerant I like because it's really, really tiny. It is. So, just like the Bokeh King version 4 is as well. So I think when you ask yourself, how you want to pair your lenses, you have to decide, do you want family members where, okay, I can use my different focal lengths, but they're going to feel similar? Mm -hmm. Or do you want distant relatives where I can use a 35 for a particular look, my 50 for a totally different look? So depending on what your objectives are and what you like about the particular lens and the way it renders will probably ultimately determine... Well, and we we talked about something similar in our previous episode with the 35 APO. Mm. Of saying, okay, because you and I both love the the 35 FLE. Yeah. And it's like, okay, well, you know, where we go from here? How does that fit in? Well, okay, uh, the 50 Lux could make a really great complement to the 35 Apo because, you know, you have this kind of perfection and flexibility with the 35 mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. a little bit more character with the 50. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, for my, for my money, I would say get something that's a little bit different that mm. gives added range because really 35 and 50, they are different, but they can kind of sub for each other mm. when necessary. Mm-hmm. So if you got something that is, you know, more modern, and more, you know, technically perfect than the than the older version four, uh, I think that gives some added flexibility of being able to use one or the other at different times. But yeah. I, I totally see your point of, mm-hmm. If you just want the same consistent fingerprint across all your shots, well, that's another way to go too. Yeah. All right. Let's keep going. Jose, I want to ask David question number seven from Jim over there. All right. The M10 has perspective control now. Will that software upgrade ever be available for the Leica Q? Um, maybe. Uh, Leica is always a updating firmware. The the Q range, the SL range has has continually gotten firmware updates. The M's have also gotten tons of firmware updates. If you want to see a history of those, again, you can go to red.forum.com. Just type in firmware, and you'll see a full listing of, of every article covering every firmware update. That being said, we don't know for sure if that perspective control uh, kind of visualization will be brought into the other systems or when. I... I guess my guess is yes, it will be eventually rolled out. But the the good news is you have it already. Everyone has it already, already in Lightroom. You can use the um, upright perspective control tool, but you don't have that pre-visualization in the camera. So what Leica is using is actually taking metadata, bringing it into to Lightroom and activating that function. Uh, you can do it manually. And I think Josh has a, there's a, you found a video. Yeah, Adobe, tutorial, right? the Adobe blog is a, is a great resource and they have a video and a tutorial about how to use perspective control in Lightroom. So mm-hmm. just because your camera didn't get that feature internally, it doesn't mean you don't have access to it. It's just, instead of proving it in the camera in real time, you just do it in post-production yeah. with your other workflow items in Lightroom. So, and I, sh- I should have mentioned also real quick, the question said the M10. The M10 actually does not have perspective control because it, oh, it lacks never the, will. It right. lacks the spirit level hardware that the M10P, R, and monochrome have. So good point. The M10P, M10R, M10 monochrome have perspective control. M10 does not because it doesn't have the hardware. Right. Yeah. I was more answering the question. No, no. I'm just, to, I'm right, just right. qualifying that question because it said M10. Correct. But actually, the M10 didn't get it. That so. is a really good point. Yeah. The Q obviously does because if you pick up a Q and turn it, you'll see that it has yeah has a virtual horizon. Yeah. Exactly. Um, but Josh is absolutely correct. The the M10 and that is a very important note. The M10 with no letters after it has no hardware for that. Yeah. So it's not a matter of um, software support. It's a matter of hardware support. Let's see, we got a super chat. 
I see that. And this is an interesting question, and we've had a few similar ones. The question is from Dimitri, how good are the Panasonic Leica DG lenses? And I will tell you that David and I, since we're spoiled, and also we live in the world of Leica only, we don't know because we don't use non-Leica lenses. So I'm not going to say they're better or they're worse because we don't, we objectively don't have an opinion. You know, David has decades and decades and decades of experience with Leica. I'm just past my first decade. Um, <laughs> and we can speak to that from a deep well of personal first-hand experience and feel comfortable making pretty decisive mm -hmm. statements. But when it comes to other brands that exist, we just, we've all played, but... Yeah, I mean, we've played with not... Honestly, I haven't played with the Panasonic DG lenses. Um, I've more played with some of the Sigma lenses, which are a little bit more interesting to me personally because they offer usefulness and capabilities that aren't even in the SL lineup yet. Uh, like their, their super wide angle, you know, things like that, that we don't have access to in native Leica lenses. So to me, that's interesting. I also know that the Sigma art lenses tend to be, you know, of a pretty good quality and great reputation. I, I don't know about the Panasonic lenses. Yeah. Honestly, I've just never used them. Um, any information, any opinion I would form is just purely based on secondhand, which isn't good yeah. enough for us to Not tell you that. that. All right, we're gonna keep, we are like running out of, this is crazy, okay. Let's, let's keep going. We're gonna, we should start with the ones that were submitted sure, by first, email. because those are really, um, let me ask, let's see, Jose, can you ask us, do you wanna go to first two? Yeah, these are. Yeah, I have a question. Sure. Well, okay. it's kind of together, right? So. Yeah, so kind of combine question two and three, if you could. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, two questions from Peter. What is the longest Leica lens one can mount on an SO2 body? And then he wants to talk about, ask about the, the Leica Apple Telet R 400mm 2.8 ROM. And with the, with the adapter, will this work on an SO2? Yeah, it will work. Yeah. You won't have <laughs> autofocus. Yeah, um, or weather sealing. It, or weather sealing, but it's a phenomenal lens. Uh, Josh and I do have experience with that lens. Uh, and it's actually a modular... Is it well, the modular he asked about the about? modular, although there was a post on was. the web recently yeah. of the moon, yeah. but that was with the fixed lens. It wasn't with okay. the modular okay. 400. So, so maybe, maybe that's... Because Leica made a fixed 280. They made a fixed 400. Um, I mean, through the years, they've made a 560 and an 800, I think, fixed as well. But, I mean, they're kind of these monstrosities. Mm. Uh, what we're thinking of is the more modern modular Apo Telet system, which was fantastic. Uh, basically, it had uh, three different focusing modules and two different focus heads that didn't have any moving parts. It were just glass. And you could make a variety of lenses from ranging from 280 to 800 or 560. Uh, I think it went all the way with a 2X. With a 2X and the, and the bigger head. 800, yeah. 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 So all the way from a 280, 28 to a 560, 56. No, or 800, uh, 800, 800 56. Yeah, something yeah. crazy like that. Crazy. Yeah. Um, and everyone in between. So we have experience with the... Uh, with the 2828, with the 400 f4, and with the 400 28, mm -hmm. and they're awesome. Yeah. The reality though is, as amazing as these Apple Telet Super Telephoto R lenses are, <laughs> they're extremely rare, mm -hmm. extremely expensive. So it's not a practical solution. They're very heavy, and they're so valuable and so rare that you wouldn't really want to take it out into the field because if something happened to it, I'm sure there's no parts left. They will mount with the R adapter L mm -hmm. onto the SL2. Um, the 90-280 SL is the longest native solution that we've got for the SL2 within the Leica family. On the SL2, you can go APS-C mode, make this 420 millimeters at 20 megapixels, so that's still pretty good. And image stabilized. And stabilized. Yeah. Well, any lens would be stabilized on the SL2, but... Um, True. Yeah. So, True. I don't double, know. Double stabilized. There's, the, Leica made an 800... <laughs> millimeter of lens. Mm -hmm. So that's te to answer your question, the longest lens that Leica has made you could use on the SL2 is the 800R lens. But finding it might be... It's, yeah, it's not, yeah. So there's deficient, there are deficiencies in the L-mount ecosystem in the telephoto side. So hopefully that gets filled in eventually. But for now, if you say, Josh, I need autofocus 400 millimeter 2.8, you're not going to really get that on an SL2 mm -hmm. yet. Or maybe ever. I don't know. <laughs> Good questions, though. Thank you, Peter. Yeah. We've got to keep going. we got to keep yep. going. Keep it around. Um, I can answer number four because I emailed him that answer already, Jose, if you want to ask. Okay. Me. 
on SO2S, I'm mm -hmm. guessing. Mm -hmm. okay. Can the sensor crop mode toggle between 35 millimeter and APS-C be set to a custom button? Uh, the answer to that is no, because I did research this already and check. You have to put it into your favorites menu. You can't actually assign it to a function button. That's the uh, 35 millimeter or APS-C modes. It would be cool because then you could, it's almost like instantly activating a digital zoom. Right. But can't do it. Yeah, you already, already know you can't do it. So. No, and I was looking to see if it could be assigned to a button on on the touchscreen, but I do not. I don't. It can. I don't think so. No, I don't uh, think it I can either. So. No. Yeah. So, good question, but unfortunately, can't do it. Let's do like two more from the spreadsheet, and then maybe yeah. a couple from the chat. So we're balancing it. Yeah, out of bit. course. I like that. Um, what do you got? I, there was one about MTM threats. What about? Answer. We can answer that one. Yeah. Number nine. Yeah, that, that's an easy, easy one to get. Um, sure. Number Why nine. Not? All right. So we're switching over gears a little bit to M. Yeah, we're bouncing around, yeah. which is fine. This question from Bill. Please go over the metering system in the Leica 240. 240. Most of my shots are underexposed. I am using the classic mode of metering. So actually, it's not just the 240. This is going to apply as well to the M10 family because that language that was introduced on the M240 generation carried through to the current, current M10 generation. Uh, what I would suggest is the classic metering. And Josh, do you want to explain just quickly between classic sure. and advanced metering? Well, one of the major advantages can, of, of a camera on the menu. Sure. One of the major advantages of, a, of an M camera with live view is now you're no longer forced to use only the light meter that's on the shutter or that reflects the shutter, which is basically a center weighted metering. Pretty basic, although it does work. When you have advanced metering mode enabled, there's a dog. Oh. It's, you didn't get to see him this time. Uh, when you have advanced metering mode enabled, you're actually opening the shutter, exposing the imaging sensor, and using the sensor as a very sophisticated metering system. So it doesn't automatically mean it's more accurate. It is better for complex lighting situations. Just David just showing you there, yeah. It, it is a little bit slower because you have to basically open the shutter, take a light meter reading, and then when you fire the take a picture, Close the shutter, open it again, and close it again for the photograph. And, and on the and this is a this is an M240. Mm. Uh, on the M240 generation, it was a lot slower to do that advanced metering than it is on the M10. Yeah. So the M10 is faster with that open kind of basically take a test picture, reset the metering, and then reshoot the image. But for that very reason, the the lag that's introduced, the classic metering, which is based off of using the classic metering, if you go back to the close-up here, uh, the classic metering is bouncing the light off of the shutter with this higher reflective area in the center and then feathering out. Uh, and then the, the, I don't know if we can pick it up on the camera, but the bottom, the, the actual meter is underneath there. Uh, so that's how the classic metering works. So it is basically center weight metering. I'm looking at these questions that are coming in. There's some good ones in here. Yeah. I'm gonna answer one very quickly, just I'm gonna skip ahead. She's a super one. Sure. Um, Mauricio Sanchez. Hi, Mauricio. He just wants to know if there is a Safari grip for the M10P Safari. There is not. Wow. I've seen somebody take a silver M10 grip and modify it to match a Safari camera, which is really cool. But Leica doesn't offer that. I, I wish. I think yeah. when the camera becomes so limited, I mean, limited the Safari to 1500, I just think it wouldn't be cost effective for Leica to come out with custom accessories. Although, as much as I would love to see that. Um, alas, we did not. So that's a cool question, though. I had to answer that. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's see. We have a couple of questions about 75 millimeter lenses, M lenses. Okay. One about the Sumerate 2.4 and one about the Cron. Maybe you want to. I think we're going to do an episode in 75 one day, but let's talk about. You want to hit those two? Let's talk Why about. The, the, because there are, I agree with Jose. There's a few questions about the 375s. Sure. sure. I'm going to take the first one, which is number. The Sumerate. 16. One. 16? No, not that one. Yeah, well, yeah, I'll take this. So, can you ask that one, Jose? 16? Yeah. Yeah, what can you say about the 75 millimeter Sumerit 2.4M? Yeah. A oh, lens. It's a, good things. It's a great lens, <laughs> no longer made. Yeah. Lightweight, easy to use, fast focusing, meaning mm -hmm. quick lock to lock um, focus throw. Um, updated design from the 2.5, so it focuses a bit closer. It feels nicer. I think it's 0.8 uh, meters minimum. I believe so, yes. Yeah. And E46 filter size, so it's not that big, very light. Mm -hmm. If you are not after crazy bokeh, or if you're going to shoot stop down, you just want a telephoto solution, if you could find a pre-owned one, especially in silver, they're really cool. Yeah. Even the 2.5 is a great lens because they're the same optically. The 75 super. It's just a uh, one meter focusing. Yeah. yeah. Um, we've talked about the Sumerits a lot. 
I'll continue to talk about them. I think they are fantastic performance for the money, small and light. And now the new two, the newer 2.4 range are all E46 filter size, so they're all very similar mm -hmm. in that respect. Um, yeah. When he says the entire range, he means not just the 75 was always 46, the yeah. 90 was always 46, yeah. but the the 35 and the 50 are also now 46. Well, not now, but the newer generation 2.4s are 46 millimeter. The prior generations were 39s. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and David, why don't you? Well, Jose, why don't you ask David um, question number 19? 19. Yeah. Highlight it now. Yeah. I'm on the wait list for a 75 Cron M mm -hmm. lens. What are your thoughts? What should I expect? How long to wait? Or um, <laughs> well, we don't know that, but we can, we don't know we can talk about the lens. Yeah. It's right over here. Yeah, sure. So here's the lens. There it is. You don't have to wait anymore. Yeah, it's right here. Yep. Come get it. Come get it. <laughs> I'll, I'll snap to a close up here. I'm sure it's quite well used. This, this one. Uh, yeah, we don't want to. Uh, <laughs> hold on, hold on, hold on. There or we did go. we not clean it off? Did you I not know. clean this? I don't know. Unbelievable. A lot of barrel here. OK. okay. Uh, so this is the, I'm turning it the wrong way. This is the 75. There we go. 75 Apo Summicron. I I really love this lens. Um, it's got a little built-in lens shade, which is nice. It's uh, E49, so it's also kind of small. And it has next to the Mac... Well, and now after the 35. The 35 is the closest focusing. But uh, this lens, because it focuses down to 0.7 meters, minimum focus, minimum focus right there, uh, it has a very high reproduction ratio. I can now say one of the highest in the in the M lineup. Um, come back to me here. Uh, now, of course, the the 90 macro can go closer, and the um, and the new 35 Apo Summicron that was just introduced can go a lot closer. But natively, this is this was the closest focusing, uh, highest reproduction ratio, I should say. So close focusing relative to long focal length. Great portrait lens. Beautiful bokeh, tack sharp at point of focus with really natural fall off. Uh, it is, I think, one of the just one of the best portrait lenses in the M lineup, without going to something exotic like the you know seventy five Noctilux, which is the next question. So right, so okay. seventy five Noctilux, is it better than the seventy five Apo Summicron? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> but it's also it's much much larger. Yeah, uh, and much much more expensive. And if you're not going to shoot everything at, at 1.25 or 1.4 and you can get by with an F2, I think the Cron is an amazing choice. Yeah. And um, I, I love it. It's a nice lens. Good. Yeah. Um, let's keep the 25 team going. Question. What do we got? Where'd it go, Jose? It was one. Uh, oh, number 13. Okay. Does it make sense to buy a 75 Noctilux to use on a film body mainly and sometimes the SO2? Well, mm. does it make sense is only a question that you as the purchaser can answer because we're not talking about a lens that's inexpensive relative to other M lenses. But from a performance, uniqueness, rendering standpoint, the lens is it's incredible. I don't know I don't know what else to say. it. It's mind-blowingly sharp, but still has an extremely fast focus fall off, mm. a really, really, really nice, soft, bokeh and rendering, a very knock the luxe feel mm -hmm. without any of the image quality uh, compromises you would get with other uh, 50 knock deluxe. So if you watch our knock deluxe episode, you can see more about that. Yep. So on the SL2, it's a joy because you have that magnification in the live view, you have stabilization. And I think on film, it would be nice because film has a little bit more tolerance for slight focusing errors where, where digital does not. So even though you don't have live view with film, I think... I don't know. I would love to see somebody shoot a 75 Noctilux like on an MP. Well, I mean, think about how long the 50 Noctilux in its various iterations have been around only for film. Yeah. And yeah, true. plenty of analog photographers through decades found a lot of use for the Noctilux. And it's created some beautiful images on film. There's, in my mind, I don't see any reason why you wouldn't do that if your preferred medium is analog. And also SL2, it makes a lot of sense. Oh, Dan says focusing. Oh, so this is we. I did talk about this in the knocked like episode, and I'll and I'll talk about it briefly again now, which is, it's actually not that hard to focus the 75 Noctilux no. on any camera because the gearing is so precise, the feel is really good, and as you start to practice using the lens, I it's actually this 75 Noctilux is the lens I use to test trade-in um, digital rangefinders mm -hmm. to see if they're in focus or not. So I'm using it with a rangefinder all the time. 
and if the rangefinder is calibrated, I will nail it. And I'm focusing on like um like a sign in my office with so this text. Yeah. So it's your reference lens. Yes, as someone who actually uses this on a rangefinder, and it is dependent on it being calibrated to work well, I would say yes. With with a little practice, there you go. It works just fine. So thank you, Dan. For yeah. Good question. Thanks for clarifying too. Um, okay, we have so many questions. Hey, James. <laughs> um, let me do. Jeez, um, there's so many. Oh, number twenty-seven from Jackson. Jose, you can ask David that. Mm -hmm. When developing images in Lightroom's development module, the lens correction panel includes lenses for the Leica M, R, and S series, but not the Q. Mm -hmm. So, which lens correction should one use? One of the mm -hmm. other Sumilux 20 millimeters lenses listed under the M, R, or S, I suppose, but which one is closest to the Q2's lens? So I'm going to bundle in uh, the Q, the Q2, as well as the uh, the SL and the SL2 and SL2S are all going to be covered in this answer. All of the SL lenses, uh, the zooms, primes, as well as the, the lenses on the Q, the 28 Sumilux Q, uh, those are built-in corrections. So you actually don't need to choose anything. You might notice at the bottom of that panel, a little eye, a little gray eye next to it say, built-in lens profile applied. It, you don't need to select one of those other manual lens profiles. It's all baked right into the profile in, photo, in Lightroom or Photoshop Camera Raw. Um, I'm going to mention it again, just a theme of the night, because I know we have more viewers now. Two things. Number one, we you can ask whatever you want, but we definitely cannot answer your questions about what's next for Leica, because we don't know. So Q3, M11, CL2, we don't have a clue. Um, we're excited for the future. Number two, um, we're pretty much spoiled and only shoot Leica, so I can't answer questions about other brands. I'm not qualified to, neither is David. So we know they exist. We think the more the merrier, but we're just not qualified because we don't shoot it. So I, that's just two things I want to mention uh, real quick. Uh, where do my questions go? I was just going to show. We the... don't have time for this, David. We have 200 million questions to answer. <laughs> you have anything in the chat? The chat is on fire. <laughs> there, there's, a, there's a lot of I have chat. one here. You go. Want to do, shoot one. Go. Question from chat. Yeah. I shoot my M10 with an SF24 flash direct at F8 <clears throat> at 180th. Uh, and it provides sh shutter speed and it provides razor sharp images. Will the new M10 monochrome behave the same way with the same settings, um, given that it's a 40 megapixel sensor where it demands more steadiness for sharpness? It's the same. Yeah, well, I and think there's scenario. two, there's kind of two points there, right? So you're talking about the difference in, in pixel size and how much more shutter speed you need, but this kind of the, complicated part of that question is that you're using flash, right? And right. flash, you're not, it isn't, it's not really the shutter speed that's helping your sharpness. It's the flash duration, which is much, much faster than that flash speed. So as long as you don't have a lot of ambient light, your your effective um, shutter speed is in the thousandths of a second. But that isn't usually the case for most people. Um, I understand that, you know, Leica does make flash systems but the vast majority of Leica shooters don't use a whole lot of flash on a normal basis. Well, this is a good point. I'm just going to skip ahead to something that I actually haven't had a chance to answer, I don't think. Well, we're going to answer the higher. shutter speed question super quick. We better be quick. It's going to be quick. Okay. Y you are correct. The higher resolution bodies, uh, a 41 megapixel on the, on the M10 monochrome and M10 R, do require a bit more speed. At, if you are just as steady with the same lens, you probably want to bump up your auto ISO settings, maybe a half stop, just to get you um, just a little bit more sharpness. Like yeah. I would feel completely comfortable at two fiftieth of a second for anything uh, with the with the M10 monochrome or M10R, and because you have so much headroom in terms of ISO with those cameras, just keep you know, don't shoot at one twenty fifth when you can shoot at two fiftieth. Yeah, because Josh, you got to say it. Well, I'll always, take a, <laughs> yes, I'll always take a grainy picture over a blurry picture. That is, that is the mantra. That's your mantra. I just want to answer Fred's question because this is great. Uh, Fred is essentially basically saying that auto ISO on the SL2 does not work if there's no lens profile applied, meaning mm -hmm. if you have a non-6-bit coded lens via the M adapter 
or a non-ROM R lens via the R adapter, anything that doesn't automatically activate a lens profile simultaneous with you not manually setting a lens profile, you don't have auto ISO. Why is that? That's because one of the threshold settings in auto ISO is for your minimum shutter speed to be one over two one, times a, a, a multiplier of the lens's focal length. So mm -hmm. one over F, one over two F. Well, in order for the camera to know F, to know the focal length, there has to be a lens profile. So when there's no lens profile, the camera can't make that calculation for you. So it just defaults, I think, to ISO 100 is what he was yes. saying. Yes, it does. So if you want to have either image stabilization or and or auto ISO on the SL2, you need to have a lens profile applied. And if it's a lens that's not in the list, just pick the closest one because you're giving up so much functionality if you don't have any profile. Well, applied. you just mentioned that very quickly, and I'm going to repeat what you just said. Yes. Not just auto ISO, image stabilization, mm. because just like it needs to know the focal length for the auto ISO calculation for minimum shutter speed, also, if it doesn't know the angle of view of the lens, of the focal length, it can't effectively calculate how much image stabilization to apply for a given amount of movement. Yeah. So that's all part of the algorithm. It needs to understand what focal length you have mounted yeah. on the camera. That's a great question, Fred. I'm glad you asked that because I've... I don't think I've talked about it before, so... This is like a... Yeah. I feel like we just did like a public safety announcement. I know, right? But we have so many more questions. So let's go back to the old spreadsheet Ruski here. Um, do -ba -do -ba -do -ba -do -ba -do. Wow, Gre greetings oh. from Germany, the SL Stefan. Hi, Stefan. Oh, hey. I, I wanted you to answer a question about the MTF charts, because I think people have asked that How to read before. That? Yeah. yeah. Sure? Well, we want to give credit to the person who asked it. Sure, where is it? 22. 22? Ah, I scrolled past it. So... Jose, you want to handle reading it out aloud for us? Yeah, and I'm sure. Yeah. Can, through Instagram from Voodoo Teddy, could you show us how to read an FT, MTF diagram? Let me pull one up and I'll show you. Yes. Okay. Thank you for that question. I think we've had this question before. I'm hoping that David does not go into a two hour Actually, lecture. What, what is an MTM, F, MTF well, diagram? Do you want to explain it sure. while, while modulation we're... transfer function? Now it makes total sense, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, total sense. Uh, actually, I'll pull this up because I think I have the MTF. Nope. Yep. Yes. Okay. So uh, switch the screen. Hold on. Let me minimize that. Can we go to the computer? We are in the computer. Oh, well, I didn't see that. I'm looking at you. You're looking at me. All right. Let me just uh, try to smooth that. You're doing great. I know. Thanks. Let's try that. There we go. There we go. You should zoom in, though. I should. If I can figure out So this how. is David's 35 Apo launch article on Red Dot Forum. There we there go. There we go. That. So, uh, a little more. All right. So this is this is an MTF chart. What you see here. Well, these are three MTF charts. Yeah, uh, it's three. <laughs> well, it's the MTF charts for a single lens. This is the 35 Aposimicron, and uh, what we're seeing. I'm just going to show here. Basically, let let's look at one, which is it's here aperture stop 2.0. So any given MTF is measured at a given aperture because performance of a lens does change as you stop down. Um, on the the y-axis, you see 0 to 100, and it's measured in percent. This is percent contrast. On the x-axis, you have 0 to 21 measured in millimeters. And that is actually the 0 is the very center of the frame, and 21 is the absolute corner of the frame. So it's 21 millimeters from the center out. And this is for a 24 by 36 millimeter full frame image. So if we were reading this for APS-C, we would only read it, I think, to the 15 mark, right? Because that's the edge of the frame. Full frame has extra demands on a lens than does APS-C because uh, the image circle has to be larger. And if you looked at this for the like S, uh, the, the numbers would go higher because it's a bigger sensor and those are larger format lenses. Now we're looking at these uh, red, red squiggly lines here. So these are, there's two different ones. You'll see here, uh, sagittal and tangential. Uh, without being too complicated, it's just in kind of different, measuring detail in different directions of the lens. What's more important is uh, what these lines represent. So we've got uh, four lines, and they represent 5, 10, 20, and 40 line pairs per millimeter. Uh, so if you just imagine that you have uh, black and white next to each other, black and white, that is a single line pair. So it's actually two lines, but one is negative. 
and black and white, black and white, black and white, black and white. If you recall Josh's test charts that he shot, how it has these very fine uh, black zebra stripes, that's essentially what we're measuring here. Just very, very, very fine. You can imagine 40 line pairs within one millimeter is very, very fine lines. So we measure lens resolution in this way by looking at the percent contrast between black and white lines. So let's say that we have 0% contrast and we're all the way at the bottom of this chart. What that means is the black will show as gray and the white will show as gray and you won't see a line. It'll just be a blur, completely blurred. So that would be 0% contrast. As we raise up in contrast, 100% contrast is perfect black and perfect white. That's generally not attainable in optical design. But as you can see on this lens, um, it's very close to 100 at five line pairs per millimeter, very close at 10, not that far off at 20, and 40 line pairs per millimeter on this lens, wide open in the center, is still showing 90% contrast wide open, which is, it's bananas. Uh, that is, this is an unusual MTF chart because normally they don't look as flat like this. So it represents a few things. One, what kind of, what can we evaluate from performance from wide open, let's say at f2 versus uh, 5.6? And we can see how the lens changes as you stop down. That's important information to know. We can see the center performance versus how much softer it is at the edge at given aperture values. And we can also see um, field curvature as well as aberrations that might show as the sagittal and tangential lines deviate from each other or cross over. So what we're looking for is as flat as possible with the lines as parallel as possible and as high as possible. And, and that's basically, in a nutshell, how to read an MTF chart. I should mention that MTF charts are uh, the not theoretical, but they're not based, they don't factor in sensor or subject matter or, or it's it's right. mathematical yeah basically so this doesn't uh and there's also not there's not a standard among manufacturers for mtf charge which means you can't compare a leica lens to a zeiss lens because they don't use the same metrics um for, to actually generate the charts right. or the same test targets mm -hmm. so this is good to compare let's say one leica lens to another if you're curious in, in terms of absolute performance how they do but it's not the end-all be-all for what makes a lens good or not because of course you don't actually look at a picture so right you could look at it the way an mtf card and go well that's awesome but then you can take a picture with the lens and go this doesn't this doesn't work for me oh i, I should show what do we show just as a comparison okay. the, the noctil the 51.2 noctil oh is that does it have mtf on it i believe okay, okay i believe i have an mtf for uh, this let's one let's see or maybe i uh, i feel like you would not have done that uh you know what i don't oh. i don't i've seen it though maybe you can try to find it while i answer the next question oh here's the 28. Let, let's look at the 20 SL. Yeah, let's see. Yeah, there we that's going to be also yeah, really very, good. very yeah. good. So anyway, that's in a nutshell. We, we have too many questions to spend more time on this one. But when we do another episode about lenses, we'll probably talk about this more and show yeah. some compare. I'll put some graphics together. Yeah. When I say I will, I mean, I'll make Kirsten do it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so let's uh, Jose, why don't you just pick another question for us from the chat, ideally? OK. Uh, question from Walter. I'm an M10 newbie. What's the best way to expose for the highlights without looking at live view? Um, well, you don't need to look at live view. I would say, number one, the camera's meter is pretty effective. And you need to use a combination of photographic experience just when you see a large swath of bright area, especially if there's a large swath of dark area where the camera's going to try to meter. I think that's the more the issue. Um, like, if, it, if everything is all white, like snow, Right. It's not actually not you'll have the opposite problem. Yeah. You're not going to blow out the snow. You're going to end up with a underexposed picture. Right. We have to when you you have to learn what the camera's light meter, not just NM10 but any camera. What yeah. is it trying to do? Because when you understand what this little computer brain is trying to do, you can work backwards from that to both make your images look better, but also anticipate how it's going to behave in a given situation. So if I'm photographing cars, for example. And I'm photographing a very, very dark, maybe a black car on a sunny day. I'm actually concerned about overexposure mm -hmm. because the camera's meter, all it's trying to do is make everything gray. Right. Well, how do you make black gray? We make it lighter. Well, that's going to mean my all my highlights are going to be overexposed. 
versus the David Snow analogy, which is the camera's trying to make the snow gray. How do you make snow gray? You make it darker. And therefore, all your highlights are going to go dark. So you don't need to use Live View. It's a, it's a combination of experience, understanding the light meter's objective, and using the camera, and we're learning how to work with exposure compensation. I, I always go to my edit, um, a customized control menu, and set my thumb wheel to direct control for exposure yes. compensation. I find that I, very I handy. I do the same. Um, and just playing around because the biggest advantage we have with digital over film is we can learn from our mistakes in real time. Mm -hmm. We can practice for free. We can take a thousand pictures for free. Well, and and you hit the nail on the head there because what I would recommend is setting your highlight warning on playback. So when you uh, take an image, try to try to learn to predict what you think is going the camera is going to do. Like Josh is saying, understand your tool. Go out, take a picture, look at the screen, and look and see if there's any flashing highlights. Yeah. I would recommend that not just as a learning tool, but also if you're, you know, taking this postcard shot once in a lifetime kind of thing, check out what you took <laughs> yeah, and make yeah. sure what yeah. you shot, yeah. you you've got all the highlights dialed in. Yeah. Um take test pictures, you know, before the moment. Test. Okay, does that look good? No, mm -hmm. adjust. Mm -hmm. Test. That looks better. Okay, we're ready to go. Yeah. I mean, and that's what I do. This isn't like right. beginner. This right. is you should just do this. I like um there's a guy ask about photographing cars and your username is E uh, 82135IS. I had an E82135 IM sport in crimson red. So tell me what color your car is. <laughs> because the IS are super rare. So I've actually only seen one or two in the wild. Um and I hope it's a six-speed, not a GT, but anyway, um I'm tangenting really badly. That now. was so esoteric um, for the BMW people. So yes, I think understanding exposure is one of the most valuable and underappreciated I say excuse me exposure metering is one of the most valuable underappreciated skills you can develop as a photographer in general because the better you understand what the camera's trying to do in relation to what you see the less time you're going to spend trying to fix exposures in post production and also with bad exposures so mm -hmm. great question I mean, I'd even just add to that. Briefly. Oh, you have Lamar Blue. So I had an E92 M3 in Lamar Blue. It's <laughs> my favorite. That's what I had after the the 82. That's my favorite color for a BMW. You have to email me a picture of your car because I bet it looks amazing. That's so cool. As I was saying, <laughs> uh, you guys can take that offline. No, no, this is this is too important. So okay. let's get another chat question because yeah. I want to make sure we get to some of these because I've answered a lot of the yeah um, questions already directly to those people. So, so, yeah, so while you're finding a question, I so I want to just finish that thought, which is, again, going back of all the decades that we've had of great film photographers, mm. they didn't have live view. They didn't see the image right away. There was, yes, film has a certain amount of latitude, so mm. does digital. Mm -hmm. But most photographers, if you ask them, like, how do you know you, like, they knew I got the shot. I know I got the timing right. I know the framing was right. I know the exposure was right. Even though it was a fleeting moment, that's understand like just practicing your craft and honing it. Um, and I think we can certainly do the same thing with digital, but you know you just gotta take that step forward and you have to have the confidence to trust yourself, trust your tools, and just keep learning. It's going to start coming in like full speed. Yeah, my goodness. Um, Jose, just I, I can't. There's too many for me to. I, yeah, I'm just gonna start asking. Right, yeah, keep, going, keep going. Keep going. Keep <laughs> going. I have a 1955 DS M3. Is it more valuable on tray with the L seal intact or after a CLA? Oh, that's a good question. It depends on the condition of the camera. And what do you want to say? What a DS is? Oh, sorry. What are you saying? What, who asked that? That's talk. I'm guessing it. Rick. Rick. Double so stroke. DS is double stroke. So the earlier M3s were double stroke, meaning it took two strokes of the film advanced lever to go to the next frame. We talked about that in our analog M episode. We did. In more depth. Um, it depends on if the camera is, what it comes with what it looks like. So um, if I had an M3 single or double stroke in mint, a really nice condition with maybe even the original box or some paperwork and it had the original L seal, which is basically a small wax seal at the 12 o'clock position on the lens mount where there's a screw underneath. Because once you service the camera the first time, you have to break that seal to take the camera apart. So when the seal is original, it means it's never been serviced. It means it's totally untouched on the inside. So I think 
If the camera can be viewed as collectible from a condition and completeness standpoint, you should keep the original L seal unless it's internally just full of gross haze and fungus. But if it's like most of the M3s that I see, which are varying from well used to pretty well used, where it's not something that I would try to sell to a collector, no, if it needs service, get it serviced. Because the odds are the person buying it next isn't going to care about the L seal. They just want a camera they can use. So good question. Hopefully that answers question. that. Yeah. Okay. What else we got, Jose? Keep them coming. I just bought the Apple Tilet M 135 millimeter to use on my M10R, and even with the Visoflex, I'm having difficult difficult time getting sharp images. Any tips? Okay. Good. Can take that one. Focus better. Uh, <laughs> wow. Yeah. No, I, I'm trying to. First of all, I would say, well, okay, I don't think it's a rangefinder calibration if you're also experiencing Visoflex issues, unless the lens somehow won't focus past. Uh, or, or focus to infinity. That is sometimes a thing that can happen on M lenses where they just need an M lens. There's, there, yeah. yeah, a lot of them where they basically you hit you hit the maximum range, you know, you're, you're, what should be infinity on the lens, but it doesn't quite actually focus to infinity. It's not super common, but it's possible that could be the issue if you're having infinity focus issues. Um, I would also determine, is it focus that you're having a problem nailing or is it um, possibly motion blur mm. and looking at what your what your shutter speed is? Because a 135, remember, there's no image stabilization. That's pretty long lens for an M camera. And if you're not used to handling that kind of focal length, um, and it was on an M10R, was it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah and an M10R, yeah. again, we talked a little bit ago about the higher resolution uh, requiring a little bit higher shutter speed. It's possible that what you are seeing as soft and thinking it's focus might be soft because of a lack of shutter speed. Mm. On a 135, I might even recommend going to 500th of a second mm. to really guarantee that that's going to be uh, getting a sharp image under normal conditions. Yeah, what I would say is anytime somebody comes to me and says they're having difficulty achieving results they're happy with with a rangefinder, I say to them, let's eliminate some variables, mm -hmm. right? Put the camera on a tripod sure. first. That eliminates the shutter speed variable. Mm -hmm. Shoot something that's not moving, that has high contrast with strong vertical lines mm -hmm. to make it easier to focus with the rangefinder patch. That eliminates that variable. Clean the rangefinder. Clean, yep, clean the rangefinders off, which we talked about like in our very, very first episode. That eliminates that variable. So mm -hmm. what you're doing is making either an actual or an imaginary checklist of all the areas that could cause a problem and trying to determine where the problem is that's actually causing you to get images you don't like. Is it your shutter speed, like David was saying? Is it maybe your eyesight needs a little diopter correction? Who knows? So do we do this kind of troubleshooting all day long. Oh yeah, I'd also say yes. that that is also kind of a gotcha on the EVFs, is the diopter correction, the built-in, do you have an EVF here? Yeah, I have a Visa Flex. Yeah, uh, on the, I'm gonna just get a little close up here. Uh, this is something, so let's say you're struggling with the rangefinder because it's dirty, so you say, oh, I'm going to use the Visoflex. Mm. But you take it out of your bag, and <laughs> yeah. it's like this. Yeah. Now, I don't. I, get, I think you guys can see where that position of this is. This is the adjustable diopter. This has happened to me I too many times for me to want to admit, but I take it out of the bag, and it rolls all the way to one side. And the thing is, when you're looking through, you still think that you can maybe achieve focus, but nev nothing's ever really sharp. And you think it's your eyes. And then you realize, oh, the diopter got knocked loose and I need to readjust it. And in fact, when I'm going out, I'll often just put a dab of gaffer's tape on this just so it doesn't move when I'm working quickly with the M. Um, so that's something to check on your on your Visiflex. And then on the on the camera itself, where we're it, it bears repeating for an 83rd time. Uh, if this if this window, which is your viewfinder, has a fingerprint on it, you're going to have a really hard time focusing. Clean that off. If you're holding the camera and a lot of people, they bump in to the rangefinder window here, if that's dirty, you're going to have a really hard time focusing. So just as a normal course of when you're taking your camera out to shoot, make sure that you take a lens cloth, clean off your rangefinder patch, and your viewfinder window, uh, that's the best advice I have for achieving better, easier focus for a rangefinder. And then when it comes to using the Visiflex, 
make sure that your diopter correction is set the way you think it is. And the easiest way to do that is to focus on the text within your viewfinder, within the, uh, like the, um, the information displays, not the image. So make sure that you're looking at your, your shutter speed aperture stuff at the bottom. Or shutter speed, not yeah. aperture. I mean, I think a quick correction, something I said earlier, I had said you can put sensor format and the SL2 in the favorites menu. You cannot do that. Therefore, the only way that I could think of to easily switch between um, 35 millimeter and APS-C mode user profile? would be to create a user profile yeah. where everything in the camera is the same except for that setting and then assign the, one of the function buttons to switch between user profiles and you can name them. So you can name them full frame and crop mode or whatever and bounce between the two user profiles. That's so I apologize for that. I didn't realize that. I don't know why they don't do it. They're weird like that sometimes, but they have certainly in past firmware updates for other cameras added things you can put in the favorites menu. Oh, like the queue. Yeah, so Tons maybe we'll, maybe we'll yeah. see that in the future. So my apologies. Uh, this this is a good follow-up question just to what we were just talking about. Jose, can you ask Martin's analog photo channel question for the David? last The last one in the live chat. Yeah. yeah. Often M lenses focus to infinity a bit sharper, be a bit sharper before the end of the focus ring stop at infinity. Yep. Doesn't make a difference top down, but wide open, the sharpest focus point might be missed. Why? Mm -hmm. um, the I know historically the reason for it is to allow for heat expansion of the of the helicoil <laughs> focusing system, where to prevent the exact thing that I was just saying that it's really awful when you're trying to focus to infinity and the lens stops short. So what Leica did is allow a little extra leeway on some lenses. It's not all lenses, but some lenses have a little extra leeway designed in where the lens, where the focus will actually go past infinity slightly. Uh, and that's the case also on, on S lenses, for instance, are designed like that. R lenses, most of them are designed like that. Uh, on the R lenses, specifically, it was for heat expansion. But you just have to be very careful. Don't just assume that all the way to one side is infinity, right. no matter what. Uh, always... Especially wide open. Especially wide open. That's Always make sure you're using the rangefinder or using live view to determine your point of focus. Don't trust completely, um, you know, the the scale on the lens. You got to pick up the pace here, Jose. All next right. question. I got one here from Thomas. Okay. How is the optical quality for portraits at 90 millimeters compared between the SL 2490, SL 90 to 280, and Summicron SL 90? Is there yes. a difference in color rendering between those three lenses? Um, uh, color, no, color not, no. No, but certainly minimum focus distance and sharpness, the 90 Epo SL Prime is going to be the winner. Mm -hmm. I think 90 on the 9280 is sharper than 90 on the 24 to 90 by a little bit. But close, so close. But it's also on a much larger lens. And of course, it's 90 to 8 versus 90 to exactly. 4. Yep. I don't spend a lot of time at 90 on either of those two lenses, funny enough. I use 90 quite a bit on the 24 to 90. Do you? Okay, so I you do. can talk about this a bit more then. But funny, I don't use 90 a lot on the 90 to 280. <laughs> See, I have the opposite. That's so, funny. yeah. I and, like the idea on the 90 to 80. And, and, you, and you like 90 and on the I 24 love, to 90. I yeah. love 90 on the 24 to 90. But we both agree the 90 Apple SL it's is better. way better. Mm -hmm. It's F2, it's smaller. So if you say, well, I love shooting at 90 and I have an SL and I want an autofocus weather sealed SL lens, you know, get a 90 SL. <laughs> as crazy as that sounds. Uh, but I would say, in all seriousness, the the twenty four to ninety at ninety, the ninety to two eighty at ninety, um, are prime lens quality, and like a prime lens quality at that. Yeah. But you are dealing with ninety f four versus ninety two eight versus ninety f two. There is differences in terms of the look that you're going to be able to achieve wide open at a given focus distance. Yeah. And I think that's what Josh is hitting on. So. Sharpness is going to be, I would say, pretty comparable between the zooms. Uh, maybe slightly better on the 90 to 280, only because that lens is ridiculous performance. And then definitely better on the on the Apple Summicron SL because it's just a reference class design. Yeah. Jose, um, I saw that Jim asked a question about 28s. Can you full, can you find that one? I want yeah. to make sure I get to that. How does the 28 millimeter Summilux? compared to the 28 millimeter f2.8 in performance, if I am looking for a more compact 28 on my M10R or M10 monochrome? I've actually mm. tested this. So 28 Elmer 2.8 versus 28 Lux 2.8, uh, 2 so the 28 Elmer wide open and the 28 Lux at 2.8 are very, very, very close. Mm. Because the 28 Elmer is, is probably one of the more underrated 
lenses. It's extremely small. It's actually higher contrast than the 28 Lux at 2.8. Distortion is very, very close, negligible. So, excuse me here. If you're not, if you don't need the 1.4 or F2 for that matter, and you're just looking for something small, I could actually justify my kid having a 28 Lux and a 20 Omerit. Mm -hmm. The 28 Crown splits the difference. It doesn't have quite the magic of the Lux or quite the compactness of the Elmerit. But if bokeh is not the objective, if you're shooting landscape, architecture, or it's just not what you're going for, the 20 Elmerit is great. I would use it without... I don't think I have one. I don't. No. I would use it without the hood, just a finishing ring, keep it super, super small on a body with a thin I mean, neck it strap. Kinda, it would kind of look like this. Yeah, with a thin neck strap for like a really, really... This really is not, but it looks very similar to this. Yeah, for a really compact... It's almost like now I'm using the lens specifically as part of what I would call a compact M kit, mm -hmm. whereas a 28 Lux is a considerably larger lens. Yes. And there it is right there. And that's really part of a more serious M kit. I'm probably going to have a couple of lenses because I'm really after something different. So hope that answers your question. The next time I see you, we can pop both lenses on the cameras and we can try them. Uh, do some watch pictures. All yeah. right. I have like a similar one. Um, okay. 21 millimeter Super Elmar M versus 24 Elmar. Which uh, one do you prefer? I'll take it. Um, they're both excellent lenses. I'd say that entire family of of the super wide angles, the, the 18 Super Elmar, the 21 Super Elmar, uh, and the 24 Elmar are just, they're, they're basically, you know, sister lenses. So they were designed at the same time and they share a lot of the same optical characteristics and performance, which is to say excellent. I say the 1821 and 24 in my mind, are interchangeable performance-wise just which focal length you prefer. Mm. So I think that if, let's say you're a 28 shooter, you got a 28th Sumalux to tack on to Josh's question. Yeah, uh, I think a 24 is too close, mm -hmm. and a 21 would be a much better fit to tie in with a 28. Uh, so especially if you had like... Sorry, uh, my dog is running into sleep. <laughs> a, a 28 and a 50, you know, a 21 makes just so much more sense mm. than a 24. Mm -hmm. If you have a 35 and a 75... A 24 makes more sense. Mm. So figure out where that's going to fit into your kit because generally uh, an ultra wide angle lens is not the primary lens in your kit. It's going to complement your mainstay lenses. So you want to figure those out first and then kind of work from there to figure out what your wide angle solution is going to be. And another quick note on that, which is um, 21 and 24 Elmars both take any 46 filter. 18 needs an adapter. So if you are doing a lot of filtration, let's say with a monochrome, sure. I would shy away from the 18. Uh, the nice thing about M10R, M10 monochromes, you've got a lot of resolution. So if you mm -hmm. have a 21, say, I wish I brought a 24. You can crop. You can crop to a 24 without giving up too, too much. Sure. Good question. Next. Great All question. Right. This one came in through Instagram. Digital M maintenance over the years other than firmware upgrade? Um, Just sensor cleaning. And I mean, you can get a CLA done. One of the... um. Here's a good, uh, a good hot tip, which I'm sure someone I like is going to get mad at me for saying this, but when you have an M, let's say you buy an M10, comes new, in the, and this is USA only, I'm not speaking for other markets. So when you buy an M10 new in the USA or an M10 variant, you get two years of warranty. So in those two years, you can send the camera in for a basic center cleaning and ca calibration, generally for free, as long as it doesn't look like you beat it with a hammer. Now, after those two years are over, if you send the camera back in, sometimes they'll do it as a courtesy. Sometimes they'll bill you. I prefer to get billed, as crazy as that sounds, because what you actually get then is a one-year warranty extension. So if you time things right, you can send your M10 in every year after the two-year warranty runs out for a service. And as long as you're paying for it <laughs> and getting a service done, you're effectively extending your warranty as long as like a customer care will allow you to do it. So I don't think... Digital M's need regular maintenance. Mm -hmm. I think they need maintenance when they need it. I've seen M10s go for years without a single service. I've seen people, some people that just use the heck out of them and then they need a CLA every six months because they just get filthy, which is fine. It just depends on how you use it. Like mm -hmm. we always say, it depends, but. Right, I just, and if you're storing it, make sure that it's in a climate controlled environment, yeah. that you're not, you know, putting it in a hot car without the air conditioning in a garage somewhere, like. Yeah. Just use common sense in terms of proper storage, yeah. uh, and you'll get a lot more longevity out of it. Because there's no wear parts per se, except for 
the shutter mechanism, yeah. uh, which can easily be replaced. So, Curvier, he made a comment. Twenty element is so nice. I wish I could find it in silver. Mm. Twenty element version two, as far as I know, there isn't a silver version, mm. at least not that I've seen. Twenty element version one, silver came with the M8 white edition and M8.2 mm -hmm. Safari, never sold by itself. So if you find a silver one, it's out there. Don't tell me because I'm gonna buy it first. Because <laughs> I with, with white engraving so too. Nice. Oh yeah. my goodness. White beautiful. engraving on a silver light. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful yeah, lights. Uh, what else we got, Jose? Question from Brian. Okay. It's kind of related to the last one. The rangefinder on my M10P is out of sync. Is my only option to send it to Leica, or are there other alternatives? You generally would want to send it to Leica because they can also clean the sensor and just give it a checkup at the same time. And like Josh said, if you're paying for the service, you, you can get, yeah. get a warranty extension. Um, Dad camera will do a calibration on a digital M, but nothing else. Right. Not He's not going to check it. He's not going to CLA it. He's not going to clean the sensor. He will do a calibration. And I know just if you're watching this, Don, you'll appreciate me saying this. If you send a digital M to DAG just to have the rangefinder calibrated, he needs a fully charged battery and a formatted memory card. And please put a note in the box so he knows who it comes from. You're welcome, Don. <laughs> anyway, good question though. Next. We have a couple of questions about circular polarizers. Oh, this is a good question for David. Um, one of them is if you're photographing the Smoky Mountains with, you know, with the haze, should it, should you use a, a polarizer in this situation, or when would you use it? Uh, no, I wouldn't. I mean, I've I've shot the Smoky Mountains. So I I do love the the low lying mist and the layers of blue. Uh, I would not use a polarizer for that because there's no light to polarize. It's very flat, diffuse light, which is what's making that kind of pretty scene. Um, polarizers are designed to work when you have. Um, say, uh, directional light where you might encounter reflections where you need to polarize that directional light. So where where I personally use polarizer and find it to be most effective is going to be around water. So um, whether you want to see through the water or you want the reflection on top of the water to be visible, that's something that you can choose by changing the polarization of their filter because they are adjustable. Uh, a lot of people think that you know, only think polarizer, blue skies, puffy white clouds, but that's something you can easily do in post-processing. And often if you have a really wide angle lens, you can actually get effects that don't affect the whole image because polarization only works at 90 degrees off axis of your light source. So if you have a lens that covers more than 90 degrees, uh, you actually want to avoid polarizers generally, or at least circular polarizers. Um, I would also use it for uh, leaves, if you're photographing leaves in sunshine, like foliage, takes the reflection off the leaves, deepens the color, not because it has some magical effect on color, but because it's removing the glare that's preventing the color from coming through uh, to the camera. So wet rocks, wet leaves, waxy leaves that reflect light, etc., uh, are all helped out by a polarizer. Those are things you cannot do in post-processing. Blue skies, I don't, that's not really what I care about. Mm -hmm. um, and bringing out the mist, you have uh, great presence tools in Lightroom that you can use, like uh, dehaze or texture and clarity. Just use them in... Uh, <laughs> judiciously? Judiciously is a yes. great word for that. Yes, yes, uh, yes. Use them very carefully because they are very powerful, but you can go too far very quickly. So trying to dial it gently uh, and see how it goes from there. But to answer your question directly, no, you don't need a polarizer to shoot misty clouds or things like that. That was good. We had some polarizer questions. Hopefully that answers all of them. If not, well, I, I think what? you were talking about this. Oh, uh, let prior. me mention that one other thing, right? So because I think that's really valuable information, right. Josh. So people would, would ask me the general question is, should I use a polarizer? Yes or no? And in my mind, there's two really, really important things to understand about using a circular polarizer. Number one, give you one as a visual aid. It's not a set it and forget it filter. If you put a color filter or a circular ND or a UV filter on your camera, you screw it on the lens and then it's you don't think about it anymore. With a polarizer, you need to a circular polarizer. It needs to be adjusted yeah. for every single photograph because the angle of light. I mean, not if you're taking the same photo over and over again, but as you're moving the camera and your scene is changing, you need to continuously be adjusting it. If you forget. You could polarize the wrong thing and not get the picture that you want. So if you if you are someone who's not going to be paying attention to the position of your circular polarizer, don't use one because it's not pop it on and forget about it. 
The other thing to think about, to think about is there is a filter factor with a polarizer, meaning you are losing some amount of light, thus requiring a longer exposure or a higher ISO. This one especially. The Yeah, so some of them, some this polarizers... This is a six-stop dark. Okay, well, that's a lot. That's okay, I don't no. need it. Some polarizers are better at this than others. The breakthrough ones are pretty good, maybe one and a half stops, or half a stop to one stop, sorry. So that uh, is important to remember. So number one, polarizers are not set it and forget it. You need to adjust it for every shot. Number two, there is some loss of light. So if you're indoors, be careful with the polarizer because you are going to have to ratchet up your ISO a little bit to accommodate for that. Yeah, but you notice how it's a rotating filter. Yes. And the reason for that is it does not act the same at this position as it does at this position. These are, uh, when we say set it and forget it, remember I commented that it works 90 degrees off axis. So you would have to have, for instance, if I am if I try to shoot this directly into the sun, it, it doesn't matter where I turn this, it won't do anything to that sky. If the sun is off to, maybe let's zoom out. If the sun is where Josh is, right? And the sun is setting over here, I can use a polarizer and what I'm seeing in front of me will be affected. But if I point it at him or completely away, 180 degrees, it won't work. It only work pointing this way or pointing that way. Uh, and that's, it also means that this polarization effect is not, like he says, not set it and forget it. You need to adjust it on every single shot to optimize what you're to to the scene that you're looking at. Somebody in the chat is beers and cameras. Oh, mm, beer. we're only missing what half of that. We've only been saying for thirty. Yeah, episodes I know we're gonna have beers. Here. If beers and cameras, if you're gonna sponsor us, send us a beer, and we'll have it right here on the table. No, David isn't allow allowed to have a beer because what will happen is he'll go like this. <laughs> and, and oh, no. You can have an empty beer bottle. Uh, Jose, next question, please. All right, let's see. Prop Does beer. Leica allow to get a partial M10 to M10P upgrade and then later get the shutter upgrade? Would you um, advise against that? Uh, I doubt it. I doubt it. Uh, maybe. That's a question for customer care. I mean, you can have a camera upgraded, uh, an M10 to an M10P, although I, I haven't sent one in recently, so I can't say for sure if they still do it. I assume so. Where you can either get everything but the shutter or everything with the shutter. You can't get partial. But nice. And this is an easy one, I'll, too. I'll ask, I'll ask you that question. So James Sullivan, James Wyatt Sullivan, mm -hmm. Currently have the Q2 monochrome and considering adding the M10 monochrome. How well does the tonality and dynamic range of the Q2 monochrome and M10 monochrome match up in post? Good question. Great question. Very close. The M10 has M10 monochrome has a slight edge in terms of performance over the Q2 monochrome, but it is very close. And in fact, I would guide you to um, a comprehensive comparison that I did on Red Dot Forum not that long ago. Uh, where it's called Black and White ISO Showdown 2021, right? 2021? Sounds about right. Sounds about right. And I matched up the... the... <laughs> red, red dot lager? Yes. Oh my what? goodness. Red dot we lager. Red... Oh, we never thought of doing our own beer. Um, Next episode. Yeah. Sorry. So, uh, so you can see I compared the Q2 monochrome against the M10 monochrome at every ISO, as well as comparing the Q2 monochrome versus the Q2 converted to... Uh, for kind of Ugh. converted from color to black and white against the Q2 monochrome, native black and white. And then also the, and we did the M10R versus the M10 monochrome, again, colored black and white. Yeah. So if you have not seen that, I highly recommend you check it out. It is, um, I think, a very valuable resource. If you're looking to compare any of those like, call them 40 megapixel-ish Leica cameras that are in the current lineup of how they perform at, all the various ISO settings to each other. Nice. Next question. Okay. Uh, let's see. I lost it. Hold on. Hold on. All right. <laughs> the sun is not where Josh is. The Josh is the sun. <laughs> you guys, you guys said it. You guys. That's like a Chuck Norris they, joke. They know me very well in the chat, apparently. Uh, I am quite radiant, I will say. Yes, yes, yes. You're glowing. <laughs> You're glowing, sir. All right. Let's see. Shadow recovery differences between SO2S, SO2, uh, S007. Oh. Um, mm. I think that... Okay, so the S cameras in general do have the best shadow recovery. Mm -hmm. A lot of that depends on your... The image at hand, and if you are under or overexposed, it's not 
I would say all things being equal, like if you had the same picture and you just set up each camera next to each other. Say the 007. The 007 by about, or the S3 yeah, has the best shadow recovery. Maybe by one stop. But because the two cameras don't necessarily are not apples to apples, it's not always going to be that way. But I'll say this. If your objective is the absolute highest level of Leica image quality, the S3 with an S lens, people always ask us what's the best. That's the best. That sensor is incredible. Those lenses are insane. Mm -hmm. It's as good as it gets. Objectively. Now, of course, that camera isn't for everyone. It's large and a little slow and kind of expensive, but... But you know what? You know. There are secondhand S007s yeah, on the market. Yeah, for $5,700, you get a camera that was 20-something thousand when it was new or whatever With it was. 15 and a half stops I, in the range. I think we're going to talk about this on our next episode, but the 007 is one of the most underrated Leica products currently. It wasn't underrated Very for true. me. I used it for years. I know, my but, main I mean, tool. it is underrated now. I think yeah. now it is. Um... But we got to keep going because we have sure. too many questions and we're getting late. Jose, go. If a lens suffers from focus shift, what does it mean? I want to buy a preospheric FLE 35, mm. but I'm afraid of focus shift. Well, well I, just, I just answered this question. Well, not a, I, I think, clarify. So there's no preospheric FLE. No. I think you meant a pre-FLE. Yeah, I think that's aspheric. what you said, isn't it? Is that what you said? Pre-FLE? Yeah. Pre-FLE. So pre -FLE, fo FLE, yeah. focus shift is a phenomenon which is unique to rangefinders in terms of it affecting your images. As you stop your aperture down between wide open and mm, two or three stops down from wide open, so let's say one four two two eight of four, the point of focus shifts ever so slightly. What that means on a rangefinder is because a rangefinder is calibrated for a fixed position, and you can't you're not looking through the lens unless you're using live view. If you're at one four, stop down to f two, and you get a little bit of focus shift, without actually touching the focus ring, your image could be slightly soft. The pre-floating element version of the Sumalux 3514, uh, that's catalog number 11874, for those who care, is known to suffer from some focus shift. Every lens is different, and because these lenses have been out for a long time, a lot of them have been calibrated and adjusted to knock out some of it. You can't get rid of all of it. It depends on your exact camera calibration as well, how often you shoot at 1.4 or 2 or 2.8. Um, that lens has definitely had a bit of a resurgence because it still is very high performing wide open very close to the fle as long as you don't mind that giant plastic clunky lens it so focus shift is not as dramatic or scary i think as you might think it will be and if you know you're going to spend a lot of time in a given aperture a lens can be calibrated for that so it's a non-issue yeah i mean i'd even add the what a lot of people did with that lens which you can still request if you want to get it calibrated this way is to have it have the 35 a spheric pre-FLE uh, calibrated to slightly front focus at 1.4. Mm. Um, and I mean, very slightly. So just having it slightly front focus at 1.4, you probably won't notice that um, as much as a back focusing F2 and 2.8 as when you, you know, if it's properly calibrated wide open, pinpoint, uh, it will back focus at 2 and 2.8 and kind of resolve itself by a 4. If it's calibrated to slightly front focus at 1.4, it will be properly focused at f2, properly focused at 2.8, and look fine at f4. So you'll just have that one aperture rather than, than two that act wonky, and you can kind of mentally adjust for it. And of course, with live view, it's irrelevant because yeah, focus shift is a rangefinder only phenomenon. Right, so right, if you're right. using Vsupply, it's, it doesn't matter. It's smooth. Yeah, it's smooth. Next. All right. Is the Leica SF20 flash a TTL flash, and will it work on my MP240? Nah, SF20? Mm -hmm. I don't think so, man. Mm, I, don't I haven't think... seen an SF20 was like an M7 era flash. M6. M6 era flash. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. That's a good... I don't know the answer to that, because we, in general, don't do a lot of flash photography, mm. and the SF20 and the 24D are cool if you don't mind only direct flash, but... SF40 is so capable that it would be hard for me to use anything else. Um, so, But I don't actually know. Yeah. I don't actually know what would happen if you put an SF20. Oh, well, I'll say this. Next time I get an SF20, I'll we'll bring it on the out. show, and we'll do it and we'll do it live and see what happens. I would also just make my recommendation that I think that M's especially, and Leica's in general, tend to be more responsive and faster with less lag and equally good flash results, setting it a flash to A rather than TTL. I almost always use a flash in A mode, which means the flash we will, is covering its meter. We will eventually do a flash episode. Eventually. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Sorry. I sent you the list of ideas, so okay. it was on there. Okay. I remember it was Julie's idea. It was yeah. on there. One day. So, eventually. 
but let's keep going because that was a good question. It requires more research, but thank you. Does the lens profile requirement for auto ISO function also apply to the M10R? I don't think so. That's a good question. I have an M10R right here. I saw no. that question earlier. I don't believe it does because you it have a hard, a hard position. Um, actually, I don't think I have a non 6 coated lens here to try it on. I have one outside. Uh, it's too far away. Um, <laughs> you can just cover it with... I'll the, just turn off lens detection. There you go. And I have auto ISO. Let's see what happens. Mm -hmm. well, it still works. Yeah. Well, let's see what happens if I go. Because I believe it defaults to like a 40th or something like that. Let me see. ISO setup, auto ISO. It's a 1 over 4F. Yeah, it still works. Yeah, you don't have any issues. It's just, um, doesn't. it's not going to really be that accurate if you use 1 over F. But if you use 1 over a fixed speed, it's the same result. Yeah, good question. Moving on. Buddha. I am looking at getting a 28 cron SL or 35 cron SL. Are they similar in image quality? Yes. 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 I went out and shot with the 28 SL uh, in at the end of February, thanks to John. Thank you for letting me do that. And it's as good as the 35 in my... I mean, it's crazy. It's close. It's so, so, so good. I wish they were easier to get. They will be eventually. Because I remember how hard the 35 was to get for a while, and now they're generally in stock. Mm -hmm. So, ugh. So good. The best 28 like has ever made. And I have no problem saying that because it really is incredible. Yep. And still the best 35 they made. Yeah. Next. I know Josh is a big fan of aperture priority with exposure compensation. Is there a way to set up the SO2 to use the back wheel on a, man on a manual lens? Or how does Josh use exposure compensation on an SO2? Uh, you could. Yeah, although... you can reverse the wheels, you... but I never do it that no. way. No. I mean, the way that we both do this... That's not an SL2. Uh, this this is an SL2. Close enough. Yeah. Uh, is by default the back wheel here. The back wheel is for aperture, which is probably more what you want to control. And then it's very logical that the top wheel, so ap let me show again since you have the close up, is this is going to control aperture here. And this is going to control your uh, exposure compensation. Now, if you want to come back, this is very logical because. This looks a lot like a shutter speed dial. And essentially, when you're in aperture priority and you're it's adjusting. Not beer, not unfortunately. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, vodka, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, this represents a, a traditional shutter speed dial that you would have on top of a camera. Mm -hmm. So, to me, it makes a whole lot of sense. You've got aperture control on the back, and your top wheel is your shutter speed, which essentially is what you're doing when you're dialing in exposure compensation. Because let's say I'm at ISO 400 at f5.6, and I'm at 2 50th of a second, and I need to make it a stop darker. Well, what am I essentially doing? By going minus 1, I'm making it 500th of a second. If I was going plus 1, it would be 125th, which is essentially me turning a shutter speed dial in manual. Mm -hmm. It's kind of the same thing. That's why we consider, both of us, consider aperture priority still kind of a manual control when you're using exposure compensation because Very you're true. affecting shutter speed. Good question, though. Next. So you could switch it. We just don't recommend that you do. How's that? There you go. Is there any advantage to using an Apple lens, 35 or 50 millimeter, on an analog camera? Or are these lenses specifically optimized for digital sensors? Uh, I'll tell you, I saw someone send me some scans from an MA with a 50 Apple maybe a year ago. And I was blown away. So yes, the good images are good images. The performance right? of these lenses wide open on film is still noticeably better than a non-Apple lens, in my opinion. And I'm going to go back to what I. This is the third time I'm saying it. We have decades worth. Leica has made Apple lenses before, mm. in only the film era. Uh, there was a lot of R lenses, like mm. like think about the uh, the 280 Apo or the 100 Apo Macro or the 100 Apo Macro. Yeah. These were film only lenses, yeah. and they're noticeably better on film than their prior yes. lens iterations. So absolutely, are you, you're going to see a difference. Good question. Thank you. Next. Is the Q2 lens as good as the 28 Lux M? Yeah. Gener generally, yeah. Yeah. I, I, um, good question. I would say as, as apples to apples as you can get, they're very, they're very similar. I think the 28 Lux M has a slight advantage. You can see this in the comparison. Which comparison? The black and white ISO showdown. It was all done at 28 millimeter. Oh, fair point. So I shot all with the 28 Sumalux M versus the built-in 28 on the Q. And you can see for yourself. Okay. And yeah, they hold up really well. Next question. What are your opinions on TL2 versus CL? 
Ooh, that's a good question. <laughs> the TL2 is the most non-traditional, we don't have one, nope. is the most non-traditional camera like it currently makes. A couple of buttons, that's it. See you. Complete touchscreen interface. Icons that are totally customizable, meaning you can move around and control what icons and settings you have access to at your fingertips. If you're looking for a camera that's just a totally different experience, you get that solid block of aluminum. Mm -hmm. The TL2 is definitely underrated. The lack of a built-in viewfinder is what I think discourages most serious amateurs. You can put the VisaFlex on it. Works fine. Has an advantage, though, because you can tilt it up for 90-degree viewing. True. Yep. And its performance in terms of image quality is the same as the same. CL because it's the same sensor. It takes all the all-mount lenses. I think, and I've talked about this before, the T series of cameras, the original T, the TL, and the TL2, they get a bad rap sometimes because the autofocus isn't super, super fast. But remember one important thing. These are L-mount cameras. Mm -hmm. That means all the adapters and all the all-mount lenses work so you can actually use the TL2 as a fantastic M lens platform. Even the original T, mm -hmm. it's one of the most interesting and affordable ways to get a Leica produced modern digital camera to use with M lenses. It's got uh, a focus magnification control right on the top dial, super, super easy to use. Mm -hmm. So don't dismiss the TL2 just because it's different. It just requires a little bit of different of approach. Image quality is great. Yeah. Um, and then I'd say on the CL side of things, this is my CL. Uh, it has that traditional, you know, Leica aesthetic going back to the original Leica 1. It's the same dimensions. Mm -hmm. And I like the customizable buttons, and it's still a pretty simplified yeah. user interface. The CL is more traditional. If yeah. you know how to use an M10, you'll figure out the CL. I would say the the TL2, so barring image quality, because they are the same performance, mm -hmm. same, same sensor, same image processor, all that, uh, same color science. The difference is this is more iconic and familiar, and the TL2 is more, I would just say... Slick. Well, it's like modern art that you can take pictures with. It is very beautiful, yeah. and it feels gr that machined aluminum unibody just... It's nice. Yeah. It's nice. It's like if a uh, MacBook and a Leica <laughs> had a baby. <laughs> nice. Good question. What's next? At what point will one see differences between full-frame and APS-C sensors? Um, you may not. You may not. At base ISO, like I've compared the CL to the original SL, which are both 24 megapixel sensors, they're pretty darn close. Um, and a lot you... of a lot of that has to do with how excellent the TL glass is. Yeah. You know, the TL glass is designed around that APS imager to perform at a really high level. And I mean, we've shown people you know, 20 by 30 inch prints taken with the somewhere the 35. I have it on the on the SL here, the 35 TL, which is just a phenomenal lens, it's 35 1.4. And honestly, you put that on a CL, nine out of 10 people think it's full frame. Yeah, I mean, we, as David said, we have very large prints that we've, numerous that we've made with the mm -hmm. CL and they're pretty nice, so. Nobody can tell. I think there are other performance advantages, maybe low light and also mm -hmm. speed and things like that and depth of field. Plus, it's easier to go wide angle with full frame. Right. But you're not really shorting yourself from an image quality standpoint if you're shooting with a CL, in my opinion. We have a whole episode on the CL, so you should watch it later. <laughs> Next question. If I'm shooting mostly at f4 and above, is there any benefit for me to choose a 35 spherical version 2 Summicron versus a 35 spherical version 2 Summerit? Um, at f4, they're pretty close, I think. The 35 is spherical, still has a nicer out of focus rendering, but you're splitting hairs at that point. I would go with the Sumer and then buy another lens with the difference that you saved. If you're at F, if you know for sure you're not going to go at F, you, like if you don't care about bokeh or a wide open, like you know that for sure. Yeah, Sumer it's a great lens, super light, super easy. Um, the other thing is, of course, you can't buy a Sumer new anymore. Mm -hmm. So if you say, well, I only want to buy new lenses, well, that's a moot point. You have to get the Sumer ground. So, I mean, they're both great choices. Can't go wrong with either. Yeah. Next. Okay. What's the difference between CCD and CMOS, David? No, first of all, <laughs> you can answer that question, but it has to be two sentences because we have agree. not a lot of time. We, we have talked about this previously in our Digital M episode and also I think in our blah, 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 blah something. Uh, I have addressed it many times in, in written content as well. Um, essentially, CCD is one technology. CMOS is another technology. I wouldn't say that one has a look, and I've, started, I've talked to the engineers at Leica. There is, a, they dismiss out of hand that there is a look to CCD versus a look 
to CMOS. It really is how they choose to process those pixels. They've said that. They're like, should we make a CCD profile with limited dynamic range? We could do that. Um, the CMOS is just more advanced technology. So it has greater dynamic range, um, much better low light performance, high SO performance, much greater shadow recoverability, et cetera. Um, it's also had live view capability, which the CCD did not, and except for various specialty applications, caveat, star, whatever, but not in Leica. Um, I think the basically CMOS in every measurable way is going to be a a better sensor overall. I don't think Leica is going back to CCD anytime soon or ever. And if new technology comes up that supplants CMOS and you know can improve upon that, I think Leica would move to that too. It's just a matter of using what is the best available technology at the time for the camera's um, design criteria. And if you want to see more detail on CCD versus CMOS and try to kind of debunk some of the mythology around that, many years ago now, I did a, a three-part series called uh, CCD, CCD versus CMOS, The Great Debate. You can check it out on Red Dot Forum. And in fact, you can vote because I have side-by-side -side comparisons and you can see if you can pick out the CCD images. And I'll leave yeah. it at that. Okay, good Thanks. answer. Let's keep going because it's 9.26. It is. We want to try to get to as many questions as we can. Fire away. Cool up, but more keep coming in. Yeah, you right. guys are that's like good, though. We love fire. it. We love it. We love it. Which Leica camera would you recommend for a beginner photographer? Uh, Ooh, I either mean, the Q... I would say a used Q hmm. is going to give you the best balance of full frame, full feature set, and good performance without being overly complicated or forcing you to choose a lens because you're stuck with the 28. So well, I mean, you, I wouldn't rule out a new Q2. Just well, I think this is if you're starting, it just depends dependent. on your budget, right? Right. But just assuming the average person can save up twenty-five to three twenty to three thousand dollars for a used Q, which is going to hold its value. Yeah. I, vote, I vote CL or CL with an eighteen, same this price. Is, this right here, you yeah. can yeah, great kit. You I can't go wrong with either one. Used. This is like or, or new. I think this is about. It's $3,000 yeah. thereabouts. I, I, like, yeah. I like the idea of the beginner getting a camera that you can't change the lens on, because I, I, I do think that forces you to, mm. to spend less time on equipment and more time on shooting. But thankfully, you have a couple options. and Yeah, and then I would give a third option into the mix, which would be a used M240 yeah. with either a 35 or a 50 lens. Yeah, that's like double the price, though. So. <laughs> depends <laughs> on the lens, I guess. But beginner M shooter. depends on your budget. Okay. Yeah, if okay. you're a beginner M shooter, I would definitely start out with a, a used M240 and a 35 or 50 Summicron or Sumerit. Um, okay. And I think that would be a killer killer camera to start out with. Next. I have an MD. Should I use only six bit coded lenses? Will my camera recognize non coded lenses and how will they perform? Hmm. You can use hmm. non, uh, non six bit coded lenses. Leica uses the R adapter M, it's sort of like a blanket profile, lens profile. So Leica uses the R adapter M profile for that situation. So because there's no stabilization, it's not, it's like on the SL2, you're not losing any functionality. But, but there is corner shading um, correction. Yeah, yeah, you're losing a little, a tiny, tiny bit of, of vignetting correction. It's nominal, so it's not a concern that I would have. If you have an MD-262, you're already a strange individual, so uh, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I love that camera. I love the M10D, which I have right here, actually, on the table. Um, M10D yeah, is a bit different because you can control some of the settings via Wi-Fi. Over the app. Uh, yeah. Whereas the MD-262, you cannot. Right. So... Uh, no, it's not a problem. Next. Does the S still have a place in the lineup? If so, aside from being a, di a digital medium format, which one and why? Well, those, that's the mm. new like a door. No, wait, no. <laughs> Don't get David started about the S, or me, actually, because we have strong feelings regarding the viability and the underappreciated nature of the S system in general. Before David gets started on this question, we do have an entire episode dedicated to the S system, as well as a whole bunch of content on oh Red Forum a regarding the worth. S, all the models, S2, 006, blah, blah, blah. I'll turn it over to you. Keeping in mind that... No, I, we I only think have this is... Minutes. Right, this is too too big a topic to really dive into, but yes, I do believe the S has a place in the lineup. Josh hit it on the head, I mean, shortly ago, saying, if you want the absolute best available image quality in Leica, the S3 is that camera. 
Uh, it is top of the range. It does not have all of the, the whiz bang features and technology, you know, doodads and whatnots as the SL2, which I also love and is an incredible camera. But just from a pure image quality perspective, from an uh, optical SLR experience and an incredible lens lineup that really strikes, I, I think, a wonderful balance between the optical perfection that Leica has been able to achieve in the SL lineup with the, call it the, the more emotional, naturalistic feel of the M lenses. They've really merged those well together in the S lineup. It's kind of a perfect balance of those. So you have that biting sharpness, but you know, smoothness and, and subtlety. Uh, and there's nothing like it in terms of dynamic range and basically single shot HDR capability and ruggedness. And we have to stop. And it goes on and on and on. <laughs> Steven's never going to stop. So yeah, I could wax poetic about the S because it, it's near and dear to our hearts and mine especially. Mm -hmm. um, we've, we've been there and done that together, the camera and I. So um, yes. don't don't dismiss it out of hand because it doesn't have all the latest features. Yeah, and it's what. not what it's about. But it's not what it's about. Next question, please. All right. This one just came in from Bill. I have an M246 monochrome, which has a 24 megapixel sensor. Does it behave better at low light situations than the M10 monochrome? I'm thinking of the SO2 versus SO2S behavior. Well, I'll answer this because your answer will be too long. David's <laughs> 2021 black and white comparison article <laughs> answers this question. He actually did compare the monochrome to the monochrome at every single ISO. Mm -hmm. So you can see very clearly where the cameras differ. The short answer is the M10 monochrome is better. Despite the it being... 2020 version, the yeah. previous one. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. 2020, right? There's two of them. Like there's multiple. There's yes. the 2020 one, the one that incorporates the M10 monochrome and yep. the 246. We compare them head to head yep. at every ISO. There's crops, close-ups, full res. Check it out, and you will see that the M10 monochrome is better. But don't take our word for it. Go check it out. Next question. What is the true base ISO of the M10P? Uh, 200. 200. Yeah, 200. Or is it 100? Uh, I always shoot it at 200 because I just feel like it's the best. It's the sweet spot. Where are we? Uh, M10P is right here. Well, on the dial, it's a hundred. It, there is a hundred, but I feel like 200 is the sweet spot. But that's purely subjective. And, and actually, and if you look at some of my detailed ISO testing, there's no discernible difference between 100 and 200 on on these cameras. Um, I would say that. I would avoid like on the on the Q2 and the on the SL2. I would avoid 50 ISO because it's a pull. But yeah. I'm not a hundred percent sure if 100 is a, a pull setting on here and if 200 is native. Yeah, I always shoot at 200, and um, I'm, it's worked for me. So that's well, that's yeah. my experiential but not technical answer. There's no loss in image quality, exactly. and you get an extra stop to do whatever you want to do with. Excellent question, though. Carry on. Will the SO2 or SO2S be a better companion to the M10R for sharing M lenses? Well... Better companion than, oh, one right, or the other? Right, SL2 or SO2S with an M10R? I, Correct. I'll take it. Okay. Uh, this is dependent on your intended use case. Mm. So the SL2 is going to be better at high resolution, um, favorable light imaging. So if if you already have an M10R that's a great low light camera, the SL2 is not is, is not in the same uh, kind of performance league when it comes to extreme low light performance as the M10R, which you can see in my review comparison because I did compare those two cameras. Um, the SL2S is insanely good in low light. So if you're looking for another really good low light camera, and also the SL2S is going to be a bit better for video than the SL2. Mm. You know, we're filming right now with SL2Ss because they are the best available video system in Leica. Um, but you are going to sacrifice a bit on resolution. So you get 24 megapixel versus 47. Some people might actually want 24 versus 47 if you're an event photographer and you're looking for a camera where you can bang out a bunch of shots and process them quicker and not take up as much memory or computer time. 24 is great and you don't need 47. But if you're shooting landscape or architecture or fine art where you really need that extra resolution, the SL2 is um, it's hard to beat. But Good otherwise, feature-wise, yeah. feature they're the same. Thankfully, you can't go wrong with either. It just, like we always say, it does depend because context is important. Yeah. You know, we joke and we say, oh, it depends. But of course, 
everybody's particular use case is going to be different and we don't want to just make there's blanket, blanket statements yeah. without knowing what you're trying to do unless it's like a feather down comforter because those are very comfortable those are <laughs> that's like a josh level type of joke that's, <laughs> that's a dad joke okay Whew. next question is there a way to modify a lens with a one meter close focus to focus to 0.7 meters rangefinder coupled not that no. i know of not rangefinder coupled no definitely not rangefinder coupled well the nine no no no. I'm trying to think the version one macro adapter. I think it only works with the 90 macro. Although I haven't actually tried it. But it's it. not range finder coupled. It is. The version one macro adapter is range finder coupled. Uh, yeah, with the goggles. Oh, yeah, yeah, with the goggles. Yeah. Um, sure. Although I don't know if that would work with any other lens. Mm. Something to try. I'll get Look back at to our you. Macro I'll get back to you on that. Well, I didn't even answer <laughs> that episode because I didn't try that. So I will. Not, not practically, but I'm going to find out because now I'm curious. Okay. Next question. Do you have any tips for taking the M10 out for a wander around the neighborhood to snap things that don't end up in the trash? Any inspiration? Um, I would do something. I would try to put some constraints on yourself, hmm. either by using an unusual lens like a 21 or a 135 or only shooting at minimum distance or only shooting wide open, things like that. Um, you know, that's less of a camera technique thing and more of a creative exercise, which I'm all about. Skill drill. Yeah. So yeah. I think it's really up to you and what you like in terms of your subjective image quality and creative goals. But, you know, the more when you're doing something like that, where you're just trying to work that creative muscle, you try to give yourself limitations so that you're not, you know, it's like if you have a 50 lane highway and you're learning how to drive, it's not really going to teach you much because no matter where you wander, you're going to be on the road. If you have a one lane road, you really got to be paying attention. You got to stay focused. It's the same kind of thing with photography. Good comparison. Thank you. I just thought of that. <laughs> Next question. Uh, where can I fix my Leica CL film camera? Uh, Dad camera is the only place that I know that can fix a, an analog CL. And it does depend on what's broken. So if there's parts available. Yeah. 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 Question here for David. Um, how do you shoot video using a Q2? Or if you have any tips for using for shooting video on the Q2? Honestly, I haven't shot a lot of video on the Q2 because I just I shoot video on the SL2, the SL2S, and and prior to that the the SL601. Um, I, I'm sure you you can shoot video on the Q2. I just haven't really done it because I often use um, ex, you know I'm often recording externally over HDMI. Or using an external audio recorder, and those aren't really possible with the with the Q2. I think if you're doing stuff that's, you know, B-roll where you don't have audio, uh, certainly it would be a whole lot easier to put a, a Q2 into a small into a small handheld gimbal. Mm. Um, I'll, but, I'll I'll turn it around and say this: if anybody who's watching today has done video work that they're happy with or excited about on the Q2, it. feel free to drop a link to your site or social media. Yeah. Or whatever, because we love seeing stuff that people do what we don't do or haven't tried much. There you go. Um, I like that. Yeah, that's a good question though. One that worth is worth exploring further. One day. We're running out of time though. Keep, keep going. going. Keep going. Keep going. In an old episode, you mentioned about an annoying photo assignment where you had to put a subject in the four corners of the frame. Mm. Can mm. you elaborate on that, please? Sure. So, <laughs> well, when you look at What's a good analogy? I, I got to make more good analogies, right? It's kind of like if you're going on a long trip and you have a suitcase, you don't pack a suitcase halfway and then go to another suitcase. You fill the suitcase and use all the available space you have at your disposal. That's what, how you have to envision your frame, meaning the picture that you're about to take. You don't just have the center available to you. You have every square inch of the frame available to you. So the four corners exercise is designed to force you to think about the entire frame. Because if you're constantly looking at the corners of the frame and trying to get something filling all at least three or ideally four of those corners, then you're forcing yourself to consider the whole frame. Because you're always inevitably going to fall back to the center. So it's not like you're going to miss out on what's going on in the middle of the frame. So it's really just about getting your brain seeing the entire frame. This is harder with wide angle lenses, obviously. So if you really want to test yourself, put a 21 on your M10 or your SL and go out and try that. Um, it helps if you're like in a city or downtown area where there's like things you can get up close to. It would be hard if you're in like the desert, maybe like a cactus or something. So yeah, that's a good question. That's a, um, a both a torturous, but very satisfying exercise to really get yourself thinking about framing, filling the frame and, and using the 
imaging real estate you have available to yourself. I'm not saying you have to go all the time. I'm saying you want to know the maximum potential of your tools and then you can work backwards from there. Next question. Used Leica SL 601, is it still worth it? Oh yeah, for like two grand, you mm -hmm. get super fast, super nice viewfinder, great platform for M lenses, SL lenses. The SL 601 was a game changer when it came out. Still a great 2015. Camera. And six years later, it's still extremely capable. If it was $7,000, I would probably say no. But for $2,000-ish dollars, Crazy. yeah. Or as a backup to your and SL they're, And they're still very serviceable. You could send them in for CLA. It's not like one of those things that's like, oh, we can't fix it anymore. Well, and um, I would even add, I mean, it's still a fully modern, fast camera hmm. with a modern interface. Four and a half megapixel EVF, uh, modern touchscreen. Yeah. It shoots 10 frames a second. Yeah, it, I mean, it's awesome. Yeah, it. The only thing that it really lacks, when besides uh, the newer generation SL2, SL2s, I think the the biggest thing for most people is the lack of image stabilization and body. Mm. But if you're using a 24 to 90 or 90 to 280, they have uh, image stabilization in the lenses, and generally speaking, I mean, this is just a great all around camera and full weather ceiling, robust, the whole thing. And for two thousand dollars, it's yeah, that's yeah. a lot of camera for the money for sure. That's, I mean, you're basically that's CL money yeah. that you're getting an yeah, XL for. Pretty much. Good question, though. Uh, I saw one I wanted to answer. Oh, wait, what are you thinking, David? Um, I just. You want to answer Rob's Yeah, question? I'm just going to answer that. So yeah. uh, Rob says, why would you avoid 50 ISO on the SL? Two, what do you mean by pull? Uh, what I'm saying is native ISO on the SL2 is 100. They put 50 in so you can get a slower shutter speed. Uh, for moving water or whatever. Um, I would just avoid it. Use an ND filter to slow your shutter speed down. Don't use 50 uh, because what you're doing is you're going to clip about a stop off your highlight range. Um, so Wait, it's, it's not, not a real it. ISO setting. It's just changing the exposure before it even gives you the final image. Yeah. It's not ideal. So it's, it's worse image quality. Uh, you're yeah. actually going to get better image quality going from 100 to 400 than you would from 100 to 50. Well, I like... Um... Luis or Lewis asks real quick. I'm gonna answer this one. Is it worth upgrading the M6 binder to the MP finder? I would mm. say for value retention, resellability, yes. Assuming, assuming it's not a special edition M6 that you don't want to do that to. For actual practical use, eh, yeah, you notice it, but it's not. If you're not shooting in super bright sunlight, I don't know. I I think it's it's cool and it feels cool to have that done, but it's not necessary. And that's a lot of money. It I, is. You yeah. know, I sent an M6 to Germany to have a CLA done and the M6 uh, and the MP finder installed was like $1,000. So wow. yeah, not for the fate of wallet, for sure. Wow. I mean, it might increase your resale value, but not by $1,000. No, that's all right. It's not just about doing that. Next question. Any particular reason to get a new S lens or always go for used lenses given the price difference? I mean, that depends on a couple of factors. Number one, some people just aren't comfortable buying pre-owned. I understand that. They want to be the first person to unbox it, the first person to use it. They want to be the one to put their own wear and tear on it. Mm -hmm. If you are the kind of person who's frequently bouncing in and out of equipment or systems, buy used because you're not going to get that depreciation. I know plenty of people that bought S lenses new in 2011 and still shoot with those lenses today. Mm -hmm. So those, those are probably worth nearly now what they paid for them when they bought them new because of prices going up over time. So I can't give a definitive answer on that. It's your comfort level, your budget, and you know how frequently you bounce in and out of gear. And also, you may not find one pre-owned. Like you know, twenty fours are very hard to get pre-owned. Yeah, a little bit easier to get new. So if you got a big trip coming up to Iceland, you want to have a twenty four. So it's it's subject to availability is another variable there. And always make sure we covered this in our S episode, in our used gear episode. But always make sure that if you're getting an S lens used, make sure it has a new focus motor. Yes. Yes. Next Q2 lens, 3512. Actually, the Q3 is going to have a 20, a, a 2 to 200 F1. <laughs> and uh, this is not it's, our April. It's not it's April. April. Right it's right here. No, I, should, you know, I wish I knew what was coming. We don't know. But we don't know. I mean, we get, when we see these new releases come out, we, everyone's excited, but David and I are like, I'm on the phone with David at 10 o'clock at night. We're what talking about it. Like, yeah, it's yeah. ridiculous. Um, that's yeah. one of the fun parts of this job is, especially doing it over such a long period seeing the evolution of where Leica has, was, where they were nearly bankrupt, to now making some of the most cutting-edge imaging products objectively on the market. So 
Oh, that was a little double meaning there, objectively. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah I like yeah, that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Next question. You had one you wanted to answer, I think, David? Uh, was, uh, let's see. I think somebody... So, well, this is interesting, though. Yes. Uh, Jose, number, one, oh my gosh, 113. 113. Holy smoly. <laughs> okay. Is it worth upgrading from a first spherical Sumicron 35 millimeter to an Apple if I'm only shooting on film and bodies? Well, mm. it depends. It, well, no, it, well, no, that, see, it's a, tricky, <laughs> everything depends. See, this happens to be a trickier question yes. because one of the coolest features of that 35 Apo is its new enhanced close focus range, mm. which you can't really use on an optical rangefinder with no live view. You, you can't use it at all. No. I mean, the less you're really good at guessing. You'd have to guess. Yeah. Like take a measure. It'd be a waste of a lot of film. Yeah. So that... I, and, and that's unfortunate because I do think the lens from a, a performance perspective is significantly better than than the non-Apo 35 aspheric. But in terms of that really awesome feature, you're just not going to be able to use it. Yeah. So you're getting half a lens, if you will. Um, I don't know. I, I think I, if I'd you, probably well, stick with what you have. I would say just a caveat or tack on to that. You're, you're shooting film lens now. Mm. But if you think you may get the M11 when it comes out tomorrow, I mean, I'm so sorry. Uh, <laughs> oh, no, yeah, <laughs> just torturing people now. Because I tell you a hundred times, you, you can ask us whatever you want. But I, if you told ask you, us, wait, I told you it's not tomorrow. If, it's I, week, if, I ask, right? if you ask me what's coming next, I'm not going to know. And now I'm going to give everybody a hard time because it's our show and we can do whatever we want. Um, no, we love you guys, really, we do. Um, yeah. But in all seriousness, if you are eventually going to get or think about getting a digital M, you know, if you're thinking long term, when you buy the best of something, it lasts a lot longer and is a lot more future-proof than if you're taking steps towards it. So obviously everyone's budget is different. If you can find a way to get one, it'll last you forever. It's a game changer in the 35 focal length for M for sure. That's a great question though. Um, I feel like I'm, I'm giving everybody a hard time now, but That's okay. we're getting to that time of night where like, you know, I'm not gonna put up with it. <laughs> it's M11 confirmed, yes. You heard, it from, you heard it right from here, right from oh, Josh's mouth. Right oh, from Josh's no. mouth. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm going to be getting emails on Monday. I'm going to regret all this. Um, Any color differences between the SL601, SL2, and SL2S? Uh, I mean, uh, I use all those cameras. I've used all those cameras. And objectively, the differences are pretty small. Uh, I'd say there's larger differences between generations of M cameras in terms of native color differences. Mm. You know, going from M9 to 240 to M10, mm -hmm. we saw much greater variability in terms of the, the I hate to use the word, but out of camera, which is not true. Yeah. There's no such thing, yeah. but out of camera, <laughs> I'm going to say native, native profile performance uh, in terms of color reproduction on the M cameras was, was pretty different. But I would say that Leica has been very consistent or more consistent between the SL601, the SL2, SL2S in terms of that color science. Um, and likewise, I'd say they're very similar to the Q range as well. So they share a lot in common. And I think because David is using import profiles in Lightroom to preemptively apply a large percentage of his look editing before he even Edits. brings him into yeah. the catalog, he's not terribly concerned about out-of-camera color subtle variations out of camera whatever right <laughs> dng straight dng yeah. color variations because he's already by the time his images are in his catalog they're like 90 percent yeah toned for a base level of editing so we, he cares about dynamic range highlight recovery shadow recovery iso performance those are the real metrics mm -hmm. that he's looking for that impact his imaging um his image editing yeah far less so than how color is rendered by the camera natively because he's going to tweak it to taste yeah, and any modern camera has more than enough color gamut, if you will, to accommodate for that. So absolutely, except for the monochrome, which has no color. But... Yeah, all right. We we are like really, we are really kind of close. Oh my gosh, that. why why are there all these questions? Because they ask us anything, and I should say this: if we don't get to your question tonight, please email us um, just info at likeastarmaymer dot com. I want to try to get everyone's questions answered, even if it's just to that person who's asking. So if you don't get your question answered tonight, <sighs> shoot us an email. Yeah, someone asked about that. <laughs> um, give me a little bit of time. I'll get back to you. I promise. Um, Leave a comment. I'm just a little bit. We're well. a little overwhelmed with how many questions that we're getting, um, and our rambling answers don't help. Here's but, an easy one. Is there a 50 Sumerit lurking next to you, Josh? There is a 35 Sumerit lurking next to me right here. This is a lens that um, 
I've talked about many, many times. I love the Sumerit line. I especially like them without the lens hoods because they're the 50 and 35 are really, really small. I don't know if we can get the... Can we focus on this? Oh, that's all. Here we go. There's a 35 Sumerit for you. Can we get a close-up camera? Yeah, hey, there it is. I mean, look how tiny this thing is. It's a little guy. E46 filter. Yeah. Fun lens. I don't know. It's like, it doesn't offend anyone. It just kind of hangs out. It doesn't offend anyone. It just kind of hangs out and does its own thing. I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't have to tell you. We got more questions. Go yes. Just keep them going. Okay. Just keep them going. Advantages and disadvantages of using seal lenses on the SO2. Uh, we did talk about this in the L mount lens episode, but David, why don't you but, why don't you give us a brief answer on that? Um, I I and actually ironically on this SL six hundred one, you can see I've got a thirty five TL lens, hmm. um, which actually this particular setup I used a lot for video production because this worked great for four K uh, super thirty five crop. Uh, but you what what you're giving up on here is. You're going from 24 megapixels to 10 megapixels. For video, that's fine because 4K is only 8.2 megapixels. Now, for still photos, some people might find 10 megapixels too, sh you know, a little bit short. Uh, we found for social media, for things like that, where you're having online content, 10 megapixels is more than enough. But the SL2 really opened the door to using the the TL lenses because now you get a 20 megapixel crop with using those lenses which is basically like the native resolution of the SL2S and the SL601. Mm. And 20 megapixels is more than enough to make even, you know, about that, yeah, si I, that size. On my last, um, my last trip, I took an SL2 with a 35.14 TL and a 60 TL, and that was it. And I shot car pictures, pictures of friends, some landscape stuff, I was out west, and it was awesome. I never felt like I was limited by my equipment because I knew I wasn't gonna do anything crazy. If you've ever emailed like us from Miami and asked for photos of products that we don't have photos of yet, and I take some pictures on my desk uh, of whatever, that's actually done with an SL2 and a 60 macro. So that's a setup that I use almost every single day. Oh, this is fun. Yep. This is, I love this combo. Well, this pretend is, this is an SL, not yeah, an SL2, not right. an SL. This is, let's say for the take of an SL2 with the Elmer TL 18 millimeter 2.8, um, especially in silver, which we don't have here, but it looks awesome. Trying to get a close up here. Um, yeah, Jose's working on it. I'm talking about it. It's okay. Right. So um, you get a 20 megapixel, 28, 2.8. Mm -hmm. This is the equivalent of like an M240 with a 28 Elmer on there, except you get autofocus. Yep. And it's the lens is like a body cap. Well, autofocus, image stabilization, yeah. and extremely high performance. This, this, you know, people think, oh, it's just a, a kit lens that comes with a bundle or whatever. But but the 18 Elmer it, is actually quite the performer in terms of a, a 28. Yeah, it's actually quite good. If you ever get the chance to try one, views are like a thousand bucks. It's pretty hard to go wrong with one of these. I, mean, I think we got our close-up camera. Hey, here, right. look at that. Look Show at, them like from the side profile. Look at that. Like, yeah, like that. Look at that little guy. I mean, look, the grip, it. you almost can't see it past <laughs> the you grip. You can, you can. I love it. So this, is, is so right now I'm holding it. It's got a battery in here. It's so light. I mean, yeah. this basically is like an M size right now. Yeah, that's so cool. Uh, so this is awesome. An underrated combination. It is. For our next, it is. Uh, oh, well, a little preview there. I want to answer uh, Jason Fans. He says, I have a 35 Cron version 5 non 6-bit for my father. Does it make sense to upgrade the 6-bit or leave it at is? 6-bit for sure. There's really no lens that is 6-bit codable that I would say you would want to leave alone. Maybe like a special edition, okay. But a lens like that, that they made plenty of versions from the factory 6-bit coded, Get it 6-bit coded, get it CLA'd. You'll be glad you did, for sure. Next question. What time is it? We should talk quickly about what, we're, what our next episode is before we run out of time. Um, we're going to answer some more, but briefly, because I want to solicit ideas from people. Is that okay with you? We do that real quick? Yeah, we can take a little break, but we're going to try to still, like, just yeah, we're plow not, we're going to go through. I'm, I'm not as concerned about timing. If some people don't want to watch, they'll just sign off. Um, oh, two things. Number one, we have a couple of amazing online workshops coming up. David, can you pull them up for me, please? Um, if you're familiar with our one-on-one -on -one Lightroom training sessions with John Latimer that we offer where you can do one-on-one -on -one sessions, mm -hmm. we now have our first online Lightroom for Wait, Leica zoom in on that. workshop with John. It's from April, nope, wrong one. Nope, the other one. Mm -hmm. So it's July 31st to August 1st. Sorry, I'm just, just looking at look the here. dates. I want to get them right. Um, it's a 
online workshop dedicated to learning Lightroom for Leica photographers. So John, who has hundreds of hours now working one-on-one -on -one with our Leica clients and friends, has developed a program based around all the things that he's kind of aggregated from working with photographers who shoot CLM, SLS, you name it, into this uh, program. So, yeah, and, and you can see all the... Uh... Yeah, we've got the schedules on there. It's all broken down. It's all via Zoom. It's going to be awesome. I'm definitely going to pop in. There's John. There's John. I'm going to be in the chat. Uh, although it's not an ask us, it's not an ask us anything. So <laughs> no questions about CL2. Um, and John was actually my professor in college. He taught me what I know about Photoshop and Lightroom. And now we get to, ex to offer that to you guys. So that's yeah. one. The next one is someone asked, a few people have asked about shooting film. So Michael Turek is an amazing, amazing photographer and a fun guy too. And he's doing a workshop that's based on his uh, blended exposure technique, which is using, I don't I know how to explain it really photos. well, but it's like using analog yeah, to create these like double exposure blends that are unbelievable. Oh, so cool. That is April we'll 24th there. to, oh wait, it. I lost the date. April 24th to May 15th, because there's some film developing that has to get done in yeah, between. I'm just showing the, yes, yeah, so that's, that's an example of some of those. So images. these are both on the site, uh, under workshops, if you want to do something cool without having to go anywhere. Um, anyway, that's that. The questions just, email us. The next thing I want to talk about is the, so again, that was Lightroom Bootcamp with John Latimer, mm -hmm. um, Blended Exposure Workshop with Michael Turek. Both yep. are online workshops, meaning don't ask you where they are because they're on the internet. <laughs> okay. They're everywhere. They're everywhere. All right. We got next, that. Our next episode in two weeks, we are back to our normal schedule, is a program that um, I think is going to be pretty fun. Its tentative title is the Leica Underdogs. So this program is all about Leica items or third-party items compatible with Leica cameras that David and I and the rest of us feel that they don't get the love they deserve or they don't get used in a way that we think is maximizing their potential. Leica camera does a good job of really pigeonholing certain things and not, not doing a good job of explaining, well, this actually works with this and this and this. And David and I, having played with this stuff for a long, long time, We've shown people this in the store all the time and they go, what? It's amazing. So we're going to try to bring that sort of esoteric, quirky knowledge of unloved, underrated, underappreciated, or underutilized like a product. And I'm not just talking about cameras and lenses. We're talking about accessories, mm -hmm. gizmos and gadgets, some stuff we've talked about before, some stuff we haven't talked about on any episodes. Hidden, hidden gems. Hidden gems. Diamonds in the we rock. We can call it like a hidden gems episode. <laughs> I don't know. Well, but that's a good idea. So stay tuned for that. And if you have your own ideas of maybe epiphanies you've had about using a Leica product or accessory in a different way, mm. something that's changed the way you shoot or just been fun, let us know. Shoot us an email. We love incorporating your ideas into our episodes and we'll always give you credit. So yeah, uh, be excited for that. Two weeks from now, the Leica Underdogs and or Leica Hidden Gems or who knows what we're going to call it. But anyway, just wanted to give you a sneak preview for that. Now let's get back to some more Ooh. questions because there's probably, I'm afraid to turn my head slightly to the right because there's probably a thousand. Uh, oh my goodness. There's a lot. <laughs> there's, a lot. Questions. there's a lot. Oh boy. All, All right. right. Jose, Jose, you want to fire one off yep. to us? Yep. Why are longer exposure times for the Q2 limited? Would, might this change with a future um, firmware up upgrade? Uh, it, it very well might. They've done that before. There's yeah. precedent. Where Leica limits their exposures or requires long exposure noise reduction or anything like that, you have to understand that that Leica, basically, they don't want to offer something if it's not going to be to their level of quality. If they feel there's a compromise in image quality by offering you, you know, a two minute longer exposure, they're not going to give it to you. Uh, I know some people disagree with that and they say, well, it's up to me to decide if it's good or not. But Leica is kind of like, okay, we we're representing a certain quality level and we're only going to deliver that quality level. Um, and in the past, they have issued up firmware updates that have lengthened the exposure time significantly, actually. Yeah. Uh, which is the one that was like lengthened considerably? Uh, I don't remember. <laughs> but I mean, we've gone, yeah, there was <laughs> there's too many. I used to know all this stuff. There's so many firmware updates. There's updates and there's too many cameras now. But yeah, it's happened in the past. That's a good question, though. I wouldn't rule it out. I want to answer, uh, is that Garito's question? Garito? Yeah. Hi guys, what in 
given budget restriction, is it better to buy an SL601 or a 240 using M lenses for portrait work? I don't know what your answer is going to be. I'm going to say SL601 hmm. because to me, portrait work is about shooting wide open with very precise focus, mm -hmm. generally with longer lenses. Those are all things that are easier to do, in my opinion, with the EVF on the SL mm -hmm. than with the rangefinder window. I'm not saying you can't. People do it all the time. Plus, you'll then be able to invest eventually in L mount glass like the mm -hmm. 90, which is phenomenal for portraits. And so you're you're your current situation and then your future upgrade path, I think is a little bit better going with an SL. Plus an SL601 is like 700 to $1,000, pending, cheaper than a used 240. And it's also weather sealed, although not with M lenses. Um, you can use our lenses on it a lot easier. So uh, I would say that given that the 240's EVF2 is okay, yeah. but the EVF on the SL is amazing. I mean, I'd also add that depending on the type of portraits that you're doing. I mean, there's so many different kinds of portrait photography, but let's say that you're trying to get various looks and some spontaneity and you're firing away and you're shooting with an M240, it's gonna stop. Yeah. I mean, after about, well, it depends on which generation, but a 240 might stop at 10 or 12 pictures mm. because the buff buffer depth was only one gigabyte. Uh, with the uh, MP240, it was, double to two gigabytes and you could get up to 30 pictures depending on your memory card mm -hmm. but an sl i mean even an sl 601 can shoot verse uh, 10 frames a second for yeah. a lot more frames than that so you and i'm not saying that you shoot 10 frames a second but if you're in the moment and you're okay great let's try this let's try that let's try this let's try that uh the sl is probably going to be um keep up your with your pace better than a 240 would. I think the conversation might be different if it wasn't about portraiture and just about if I want I want to get into M photography, street photography, general travel. Yeah. Uh, what do you think about starting with an M240? I'd be like, do it. Yeah. Because um, that's an awesome kit and it gets you down the M road. Uh, so I in, in that case, I'd probably veer a little bit more to M. Mm. But because you're talking about portraiture, I'm going to agree with Josh and say the SL is going to be yeah. better because of the live view focusing, because of the longer lens capability, now, and the speed. You know why that was a good question? Because there was context. So if you if you run, like, thank you for that. Because if you just said, should I buy a used SL or a used 240, I wouldn't know how to answer that. Well, we can answer this one. Wait, you did a great context. You did a great job. And thank I'm grateful for that. I want to recognize that. And I appreciate it because the more you give us, the more, the more we, we can give, give you me. back. Yeah. And that's why we are here. Well, that didn't make fun of you, but that's not the story. I thought that was just me. <laughs> um, so, Meme, uh, Meme Ninja. Meme had, Ninja. Yeah. Woo. Is that your real name? Mm, let me see your driver's license. Yeah. <laughs> Ask, what is the best? This is an easy one for me to answer. Yes. What is the best camera for astrophotography? Mm. Easy answer. This one. This is an SL2S. Mm. This is going to be the best camera for astrophotography in the Leica lineup currently. There you go. Let me answer another question real quick. Um, using an M10 with a VisaFlex, is the delay more or less the same as the M240 with the EVF2? No. Definitely faster with the VisaFlex on the M10. Not dramatically faster, but it is faster. Noticeably. It's it's not like night and day, but it is noticeably faster mm -hmm. and smoother overall. And and a much clearer picture because you're going yeah, from 1.4 to 2.4. is way better. But I'm, that aside, it, it, because the real difference is the VisaFlex has an eye sensor, the mm -hmm. EVF2 does not. So you can just keep it on and use it when you need it. So, yeah, the VisaFlex is a significant upgrade all around. Than Although the I kind of, I kind of miss the little button on the EVF. I don't, I don't miss that button. You could, at all. you could activate the entire camera live view with that one button. But yeah, I get it, but no, I don't miss nostalgia. It. Nostalgia. Yeah, okay. Good question though. Jose, I'm all sure right. we got a few more. Yeah, can you guys talk a little bit about the M10 weather sealing shooting in the rain and snow? To me, so yes, M's are weather sealed. Sorry, with the 240, the lenses are not. There's no electronics in the lenses and they're built pretty tight. So a modern lens should be okay in a light rain. We've said this before. You just don't want to let water pool anywhere. I've led workshops to Norway and Iceland in the winter mm. in snowstorms. A third of my participants were shooting M, M cameras. We didn't have a single camera fail. So your mileage may vary, but uh, we were pretty evenly split, split between um, SL, S, and M cameras in, in those workshops. And 
every single camera came out the other side with no problems. And that's with pretty pretty significant weather. We actually had like a 30-year blizzard in Norway, mm. um, and it was fine. Apparently, uh, being ch challenged here, I didn't realize that context can be hard because <laughs> you limited to 200 characters. So, okay. Multiple messages. Fair. Multiple messages. Just, just spam the chat. No, don't do that. <laughs> I get that. But I think I was just, I mean, we are grateful for any questions or context or not. But just my point was the more specific you can be, or at least your use case, the better our answers are going to be. But of course, if we answer your question and you have more follow up, you more reachable. Just email me and I'll do my best to clarify while we're here. Yeah. Um, as, we, as we like to say, it's like, what's the best shoe? It's like, well, I don't know. Yeah. Are you going hiking or <laughs> yeah, are you exactly. going? Are you going to a wedding? Yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, if there's one shoe that does it all, tell me about it. I want it. Yeah. Uh, Jose, what, what's next? Question: Capture One Pro versus Lightroom. Which one would you suggest to start with? Well, we haven't really done much Capture One yet. This is um just a topic. We, I should say we haven't done much Capture One recently right. because both of us used to use a lot this of Capture One. This is a great question and a topic that we need to get into yeah. personally and then for an episode because there's recently been a collaboration between Leica and Capture One mm -hmm. that didn't exist before. I can't answer this question yet. I'm actually quite excited to see what Capture One brings to the table. Mm -hmm. And David and I are going to be doing some training that we're going to get some training. Yes. Um, and then experiment with stuff over the next it's going to take some time over the next few months but at some point i would like to be able to do either an episode mm -hmm. or a written content on that forum where we go into it so stand by it'll be some time but do be aware that there is compatibility between those i'm going to steal your i'm going to steal your your words here okay which is isn't it nice that we're spoiled by choice very true you know yeah so if you're a happy lightroom user i don't know that i would switch to capture one because you're already invested in an ecosystem, you already are familiar with it, you probably have a workflow set up, you already have a back catalog of all your organization and presets and whatnot. So starting from scratch, I probably wouldn't recommend that. Um, if you're, the question though is if I'm starting out, I think it's worth evaluating. And both of those softwares have free 30 day trial periods. So our first recommendation, sure you can wait on us, but there's nothing preventing you from downloading trial samples. And actually, when I made the switch way back when from Capture One to Lightroom back in the day, I took files that I, uh, the same batch of files, and I blind processed them in one, and I blind processed them in the other, and then I compared the results side by side. So I, I wasn't doing side by side editing in each program to match. I was trying to get the best result I could in Capture One and the best result I could in Lightroom and then see which was overall more pleasing to me at the end result and which was easier to get to. And I would advise that same process for anyone else. And that's what we're going to do when we evaluate internally. Yeah. I'm excited about it. I like new stuff. So I'm all good. There was a question I wanted to answer. Oh, we uh, JCC, <laughs> like we one. are going to do a video episode. When I say we, I mean David, since he's the video guy. It just uh, requires more logistics than we have yet. So I, I think that might be a Studio 2.0 thing. We have a lot of ideas for future episodes, more than we can do, really. So we're going to keep churning them out, and we appreciate the feedback, and we mm -hmm. know there are certain things that you guys want us to cover, and we will. We hear you, even if we don't always acknowledge it directly. Sometimes it's just more complex and requires more than we can do right now. But we will get there. Right. We've only been doing this for about a year, so give us some time, and we will... Make it happen. Uh, blah, blah, blah. How to use GPS and SL2. Good question. The SL2 got rid of the internal GPS that was found in the SL601. So, yeah, that little bump right here on the SL601 mm -hmm. is a GPS module. Mm -hmm. Which they got rid of on the SL2 because they needed room for the stabilization, among other things. Doesn't exist here. Fortunately, the latest version of the SL2 firmware and the Leica Photos app will geotag your images with the low energy Bluetooth that the camera puts out. So so you don't need to be connected over Wi-Fi. Correct. You yeah. can use Bluetooth LE as long as it's within range. Yeah, so you're, you, you as long as you have cell phone service and cell phone GPS, you can geotag the images that way. It's not quite as elegant as the 601, but for all the other performance benefits we got with the SL2, it's a, it's a trade-off trade that I was yeah. happy to make. Good question though. Next, what else we got, what else we got? Oh, I'm gonna ask you this question, David. Yeah. Um, Victor asks, for an M10 monochrome only shooter, is it wrong to limit myself to only E39 filter size lenses? No. I mean, no. If you like 
clearly there's no shortage of choices mm -hmm. in Leica lenses. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to tack on kind of what Josh was talking about before. Limiting yourself to one lane is sometimes a great exercise. If it was me, let's say I could easily see either a 28 Elmerit, uh, a 35 Sumicron, or Apo even, uh, 50 Apo M, which I think is a fantastic lens on the M10 monochrome. And I don't think there's any 39 longer lenses than that, is there? Uh, uh, yeah, there's the, um, the 90 macro, right? True. Yeah. So we got the 90 f4. So if you wanted to limit yourself to those lenses, those are fantastic lenses. Um, so you could have a great 28, a great 35, a great 50, and a great 90, mm. all in 39. You don't need super fast aperture lenses on the M10 monochrome because the camera shoots cleanly to 32,000 ISO. So uh, it certainly means that you have to carry much smaller filters. Yeah. All right, so. let's, let's pick a few more. I know that we can go all night, but don't forget we have Kirsten and Jose who eventually want to get some sleep. So yeah. we should, uh, we don't need and that. our viewers who are, so I'm sure, sick of hearing us. But <laughs> I'm loving the momentum we're, get, we're, we're keeping, and I want to keep it going for a little bit. Yeah, okay. There was a question I wanted to a answer from SG Rody here. Have you guys tried the adapter for H lenses on the S? I'm asking because natively the S does not have a one to one macro. I've not tried the H adapter. So I can't answer that part. What I have done is mm -hmm. there's a company in Germany that makes right angle viewfinders for the SL, SL2, and S. And they also manufacture an adapter ring that allows you to mount the L Pro R, which is the L Pro that came with the 100R macro, onto the S120 to get one to one. It's kind of weird because you have to go and find a used L Pro and then get this adapter, which we do sell, but it does work. I've seen people use it, it works pretty well. You do need to stop down to like a four or five, six to really get the most out of it, but it's surprisingly effective. So you can actually get one-to-one -one with the S120 with this combination. Uh, we didn't show it on the macro episode because I actually didn't have an L Pro R and I couldn't find one in time. So I'm sorry, but it, it does exist. It exists. Yeah. Good question. Come on. We got a few more. Do we do we do do? Uh, some of these we've answered. Some of them we, we have answered. Yeah. Um, someone asked, does an Apo lens make a difference on film compared to digital? We, we answered that. Yeah, we, we actually answered this in this, in this episode. episode. So when yep. we're done, rewatch. Rewind. I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna lean over here and let's see. Right I have here. one. If you wanna. Oh, go ahead. You got one. Go yeah. ahead. If you're careful to protect the highlights, shouldn't you still expose to the right on the M10 monochrome? I think the reason I would say no to no. that is because you have a lot less highlight dynamic range than you do shadow dynamic range. Especially in the monochrome. On the monochrome especially. So your threshold for yeah. error yeah. is so much higher doing it that way with essentially a negligible, if not non-existent, increase in performance. So no, I don't think you should do and that. And when you have three to four stops of shadow recoverability versus half a stop of highlight, I'm always gonna err on the side of underexposing by an extra half or full stop than possibly blowing out my highlights. So, yeah, I'm. We're on the same team here. Yeah. Um, I know, Jean Claude, you're asking about 20 Elmerit uh, version one and two aspheric. We did cover this on our wide angle lens episode. The short version is the con barrel construction differences and lens hood improvements alone make that a worthwhile upgrade, in my opinion. Performance is better wide open, especially out or near infinity, because it's a like more digital era lens. So. Uh, that's 11606 versus 11677. Um, I would always go for the 11677 if I could. They're pretty affordable, especially the made in Portugal ones. New or relatively affordable for an M lens. So, uh, this is an interesting question. Maro uh, asked for travel. I'm thinking about using a Leica Q2, but I don't feel safe with just one SD card slot. Will the next Q2 model is it possible that it has a double slot? What do you think about that? Well, um, the SL, I mean, even the SL601, Wait, the you SL... Don't, you don't want to show them the Q3? Oh, this is a 240, sorry. <laughs> yeah. You're really going to, like, yeah, I know. you're asking I'm, for it. I'm, it's getting late now, so I'm a little okay. punchy. So the, the SL family has, has have dual card slots because it's geared as a professional work tool. Um, that being said, I have gone to some pretty extreme places where it's very difficult to get to. I've shot with the SL... Uh, SL6, uh, SL601, SL2. I don't ever back up to a second card. As good as that sounds, I've never done it. I've never had to do it. On the Q, same thing. 
my suggestion is uh, that comes down to workflow and and risk. So here's my risk. Every day after shooting, I take my memory card, I download it into the computer and back it up. And I put it back in the camera, keep shooting the next day until it's full, but I keep incrementally backing up as I go. Sometimes even if there's a long drive between locations, uh, let's say I have a morning shoot and then I have a, a one hour drive to go to the next shot or I'm breaking for lunch, I'll download then and then back in the field. So I'm only ever missing out on whatever chunk it is of where I'm shooting to the last time I backed up. And even doing that, I have yet to lose any images on an SD card. They've been extremely reliable. It just not it, buy a good card. Yeah. Um, take care of your cards and everything should be fine. I wouldn't worry about it. Good, good answer. And true. Let me ask. Um, well, I see there's two questions I'll answer that are related to similar questions. So is the Leica TL2 and or the Leica SoFort officially dead? I hesitate to ever call any Leica product officially dead because they're known for discontinuing something only to come out with another version or variant or find more in the warehouse. I think a lot of it depends <laughs> on Leica's supplier partnerships because sometimes they may still want to make something, but they may not be able to get certain components. As of now, you can still buy a new TL2. You cannot buy a new Leica SoFort unless somebody has like residual inventory floating around. So I'm not sure what the future holds, but yeah, that's the answer to your question there. Uh, I'm sure there's more that we missed. Although we are getting, what do we got? You want to answer that? Oh, Kenny Ward asks, hey gentlemen, wondering if LSM, like Store Miami, offers more trade in value for store credit or cash versus cash. So we don't usually take credits for store credit, but if you're asking, if you say, Josh, I have an M240, if I trade it for an M10, do I get more than if I sell it to you outright? Yes, we give, I don't want to like be too salesy, but basically we give 80% of the item's fair market value for a trade towards something else. And we give 70% when we buy it outright. The other thing to know is I don't, I generally take almost everything I'm offered on trade-in, overwhelmingly so, but I'm more picky when I'm buying stuff because, you know, I if I'm just buying it, I'm only gonna buy stuff that I want for the store. I'm not gonna buy everything that's offered to me, especially if it's a really big kit. I just don't have the physical amount of space or time to go through it all. So yes, short answer, we give 10% more on a trade than we do when we buy it outright. So thank you for asking that. But that's enough salesy stuff. What's next? Okay. Uh, There's a lot more questions. I don't want, we can't answer them all. But let's do like, uh, it's 1017. Let's go like two or three more that, yep. we, that we think are interesting. Let me let me look real quick. Yeah, here. you look, you look. Um, blah, 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 blah. No, no. <laughs> I mean, they're all good. I'm just like, some of them are so, um, can you scroll down? Yep. Let's see. Stop, stop, stop. Uh, no. Wow, really, a lot of people want to know what's coming next. Like, I really I really don't know. The macro adapter with goggles is coupled with the 90 because it's designed to use on film. So that is a good question. Jason Fung asks that. Um, are we erroring out? Yeah, maybe. It's punishing us. Yes, for, for doing this too long. Taking such a long time. Um. Well, maybe that's a sign that we should call it a call possibly, it a, call possibly. It a day. Is it a video? That's okay. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, there is just tons and tons of stuff. So, what I would here's what I'm gonna say just before everyone leaves. Uh, leave comments. You know, the the chat is great, but once the once the video goes um, sort of uh, permanent. On YouTube, it takes uh, a couple hours to process, so it'll be up later tonight. Uh, leave us comments on the video, and we will do our best to answer those. Uh, or email we, us. It's yeah. also fine. Yeah, or email us. Just info at likeastarmary.com, just our general contact address. And we can uh, try to try to figure that out for you guys. Um, we don't know all the answers, but if we don't know, you, as you've probably figured out, we'll tell you that we don't know. So <laughs> I have no shame. Yeah. It's okay. So, this has been insane uh, yeah. in terms of... I'm sorry we couldn't get to everyone's question. We've gone way over the time we normally do. We still have more. Um, but no joke. I mean, I'm just looking at our little sheet here, and we have over 150 questions that have come in, Yeah, which is a lot of questions to yes. answer in any depth in, in two hours. Yeah, we don't want to... You know, some sure we'll joke and we'll skirt around some stuff, but we do want to... We do take the question seriously. So like I said, if your question did not get answered, leave a comment in the video, mm -hmm. shoot us an email... 
if it's answerable by us, we will answer. That is why we are here. Mm -hmm. So we are very, very grateful for everybody's insane participation, despite the 200 character limit, uh, <laughs> which I didn't know about until just now. So sorry. Um, I think we're going to have a really great show in the next uh, for two weeks from now yeah. with the sort of like an underdog uh, program. Mm -hmm. So stay tuned for that. Want to close us out? Whew. This has been a marathon of, <laughs> of questions. Uh, you guys are awesome for like really trying to keep us on our toes. Yeah. And I feel like it, it's been like, you know, jumping around <laughs> from like S to SL to M to whatever. Like, this is great uh, because, you know, so often with with the uh, kind of single topic videos that we do, you know, we're, we're really deep diving into one system or even last week or la last episode we did, last couple episodes, one lens. It's like yeah. one lens or one type of lens. So this has been actually a lot of fun for us because we get to really uh, flex our, our our mental whatever <laughs> you want to call it. Yes. Uh, so it, it has been enjoyable. Thanks so much for tuning in. Uh, as Josh said, we're going to be back with our Like a Underdogs episode. And we are very curious to hear what is an underdog for you that you think is underappreciated and we should shine a light on um, in our next episode. So we're going to bring ours and we want to hear what you have to say and we'll put that in there as well. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, big thanks to Jose for pouring through and organizing all these questions. Kirsten as well. Uh, Josh, always a pleasure to... Uh, to, to tap into that <laughs> insane brain of yours. Yeah, well, uh, deep, a good time. deep dive. Me people are just going to keep trying to challenge me, and I, well, I'm excited for that. Yeah. Um, and again, thanks, you guys, for tuning in. Um, again, as we said at the top of the show, please be sure to subscribe to Red Dot Forum's YouTube channel to and be sure to uh, hit the notification bell and turn on alerts so you know when we post new content or go live. And, uh, yeah, we'll see you in the next one. Uh, between then and now, make sure to leave us comments. We'll be back with you. And check out red.forum.com for any other news that we post in the meantime. And until then, we will see you in the next video. Have a good night, everybody. Good night, guys. See ya. Thank you.